Uh, I want to take a moment to just give a brief overview of the course. We're going to start out looking at uh, what happens when we have more than one particle in the system. That means we have to look into the difference between distinguishable particles and indistinguishable particles and various symmetry effects that those differences make. Um, we're going to talk about perturbation theory, both time-independent perturbation theory and then time-dependent perturbation theory, so we can deal with things like time-dependent interactions and so on that might occur in a system. We'll discuss the variational principle and different uh, techniques for estimating ground state energies and ground state wave functions. And in particular, we're going to do a lot of work with Monte Carlo techniques. And in fact, we'll spend a fair amount of time uh, dealing with Monte Carlo simulations of various kinds and computations and learning how to use those techniques to make uh, different kinds of estimates. And uh, finally, we're going to round out the semester with nuclear and particle physics, a little bit of standard model, a little bit of nuclear theory, and, uh, and apply many of the techniques we've developed through the course of the semester to those topics. So that's the overview of the entire course. Uh, now, the other thing I'd like to point out is that we've got a fair amount of flexibility here to do things that you're interested in. So I'm going to be asking you, uh, when I get back from my trip, to articulate some thoughts on what you're interested in studying of all the topics, the atomic, molecular, nuclear, particle physics, which topics are most interesting to you, and I'll see if we can incorporate as many of those ideas as possible into the course. So. What happens when you have multiple particles? Well, if you have identical particles, identical particles come in two flavors. There are bosons and there are fermions. Uh, the difference between bosons and fermions is that when you swap two bosons in a system, that the wave function uh, is the same as it was before the swap. But if you swap two fermions, two identical fermions in a quantum system, the wave func function gets a phase of minus one, or a, a phase of pi, you could say. You multiply by e to the i pi, which is minus one, so the wave function has to change sign. And this has dramatic consequences in terms of the behavior of particles that are fermions and particles that are bosons in how they interact with each other and how you build up a quantum system out of those particles. So we'll see how that goes here in a little bit. Bosons are social. They like to get together. Uh, fermions are antisocial. So w one of the consequences of the symmetry requirement is that you can't put two fermions in exactly the same quantum state. They're loners. They only uh, allow one fermion in, in a particular quantum state of the whole system. And so what that means is they tend to avoid one another, okay? So we'll see how that comes out uh, soon. So um, I want you to imagine we have an infinite square well. We're going to do the infinite square well again, but this time we're going to use, uh, we're going to put particles into the infinite square well that are either bosons or fermions. And what we're going to discover is that, uh, first of all, if you have distinguishable particles in an infinite square well, and the particles don't interact with each other, so there's no potential associated with the particle being near another particle. So these are non-interacting, distinguishable particles. Then you can get a wave function for the pair of them as simply the product of the wave functions of the individual particles. This is in the case that they're distinguishable. But if they're indistinguishable, then you have two different wave functions. One is the bosonic wave function where you have to write the wave function out uh, with particle 1 in state n1 and particle 2 in state n2 and then write it out again add to that another term that enforces the symmetry requirement that if you swap the two particles you get the same wave function so notice that the second term in this sum has n2 for particle 1 and n1 for particle 2 and the consequence of that is if you swap x1 and x2, the first term becomes the second term, and the second term becomes the first term, but the overall wave function doesn't change. So this would be a bosonic or symmetric form of an infinite square well uh, wave function. 
and if you have fermions you've got to cook it up in such a way that when you swap x1 and x2 in other words you swap the positions of the two particles in the wave function you get the same wave function back but with a minus sign so notice that the second term here has a minus sign and that enforces the anti-symmetry requirement that fermions have to satisfy so what happens to a fermion state if n1 is equal to n2 I'll let you think about that look at that expression see if you can't figure it out maybe we can talk about it in class alright I want to take a minute now to show you the demo for the first computing project which is uh, a lot like computing project 8 from last semester the two-dimensional infinite square well except now it's a one-dimensional infinite square well with two particles but you'll find that much of the code that you developed for project 8 last semester will immediately work for this project this semester because the two problems are actually quite similar alright so here we are looking at the code for computing project 1 um, this is very similar to computing project 8 you'll notice in the handout I make a lot of uh, references to computing project 8 and so um, Basically, 90% of the code is identical. The things that have changed are that now instead of using x and y, we're using x1 and x2, because in this project we're talking about a one-dimensional infinite square well in space, but with two distinguishable particles, or two indistinguishable particles in it, depending on how you set the initial conditions. The way the program works is if you want to use bosons, you um, set bosons to 1 and fermions to 0 like that if you want to use fermions you set fermions to 1 and bosons to 0 and if you want to use distinguishable particles you set them both to 0 that's the plan uh, let me just show you here let's just go ahead and use distinguishable particles to see how it works the other thing is there's two sets of initial conditions here that I've pre set up for you the uh, this set that I just uncommented has the probability of being between 0 and half of A, half of the well width equal to a constant for both particles. So both particles are equally likely to be found anywhere between 0 and A over 2 um, at the beginning. Now you're going to discover that that actually doesn't work very well for fermions because you'd be trying to put both fermions in the same state. So there's another initial condition here that you can use for fermions um, where particle 1 is between 0 and A over 4 and particle 2 is between A over 4 and A over 2 and that actually works better for fermions and you can see that you can do that for bosons as well but I wanted to start out simple um, anyway the uh, the project is almost exactly identical there's one other big difference in when you create the basis states the basis states are different for fermions, bosons, and distinguishable particles. Uh, it's all described in the handout, but you should notice the major difference here is that the fermionic and bosonic basis states are uh, symmetrized when they're constructed. So they're automatically constructed to have the correct symmetry properties for fermions, bosons, and in this case, distinguishable particles have no particular symmetry. So you can just write those out as the product of particle 1 in state 1 and particle 2 in state 2. And uh, energies are calculated in exactly the same way. And the one part I haven't given you in the starter code that I give you is the time evolution. But of course, time evolution works exactly the same way as it did for uh, last semester. So nothing, nothing terribly profound there. Let's go ahead and run the program, and you can see how it goes. Um, basically, Let's see, why didn't that... Oh, there we go. Okay. So we get a graph. We get a 3D view. So remember the, uh, the idea here is that this direction is particle 1 coordinate. This direction is particles 2, particle 2's coordinate, x-coordinate. And you can see that the uniform probability density of being uh, in the lower left hand corner. If I turn on the time you'll see that the uh, wave function evolves in time. I want to remind you the way these cylinders work. Um, these cylinders show a complex amplitude at every point in space at different times. The height 
of the cylinder is the real part. Notice that uh, the height can become negative, so you can have a negative real part. Um, and the radius of the cylinder is the imaginary part, but the imaginary part could be negative, and it's hard to see a negative radius, so what we do is we switch the color. If the imaginary part is positive, it's red. If the imaginary part is negative, it's blue. So you can see the imaginary part, the real part, uh, and you can see that this thing evolves in time. Where the cylinders are big, there's a big probability of finding the particle. Where the cylinders are small, there's a small probability, and so on. And uh, you'll recognize this graph from, this is sort of looks like the graph we had um, on the slide before we got one to the demo. Anyway, um, that's kind of how it works. You can fiddle with the initial conditions set up in the uh, program, change the particles to bosons, to fermions, and change the initial wave function by uncommenting or commenting these two lines. And uh, while the code is very similar to Project 8, and I expect you guys all did Project 8 or maybe remember Project 8, um, if you have any questions about the code, please don't hesitate to, to consult with me because I want to make sure you guys understand how it all goes. And, uh, and that's it. Okay, I just remembered there's one other thing I must show you quickly. I'm going to go down and set the initial conditions up so that fermions can work. I'm going to change the particle type to bosons and just very briefly point out that when I run this thing, um, this is the boson case. You can see that there's no restriction on having bosons right next to each other. Notice that uh, if you look at the thing, this is this diagonal here is x1 equals x2, and, and there are, there's lots of amplitude for x1 and x2 to be equal to each other, which means the bosons can be right up next to each other. If I change this to fermions, on the other hand, and run it, now we have an anti-symmetric state, and I want you to notice that there's there's kind of an exclusion zone there. X1 can never equal X2, and that's because the basis states for the fermions are explicitly anti-symmetric, and that means they have a zero there along the middle, and so the fermions can never see each other, and that has uh, significant implications. Anyway, I just wanted to show you that quickly. Okay, so I want to point out, I, you see these graphs I have here on this page, and I didn't explain what they are. Um, these are the graphs of the probability of finding both particles in the lower, in the left half of the infinite square well. In the three cases that the two particles are distinguishable, that they are bosons, and that they're fermions. And you'll notice that, you know, there's sort of qualitative similarity here between the three cases. But I want to emphasize that the details of the exact time dependence of the three different cases are different. And that's because the fact that you have a boson or a fermion or distinguishable particles has measurable consequences that uh, mean that's important. So you have to pay attention to that and understand the distinction between those cases. Uh, when you finish your project, you'll be able to run the thing using bosons, fermions, or distinguishable particles and see these exact same graphs and answer some of the questions that I cooked up for you to try to hopefully deepen your understanding of what's going on. I want to finish out today, this is not a long set of slides today, but I want to finish out by going over a section of the text. Uh, Griffiths describes something called the exchange force. And I just wanted to sort of redo his calculation using Dirac notation, just to point out that you don't necessarily have to write out all these integrals explicitly, just kind of see what's going on. The idea is to compute the expectation value of the square difference between the position of the two particles. In the case of distinguishable particles, you just use the distinguishable ket AB. Now, the fact that it's written AB, the order is important. It means that particle 1, the first particle, is in state A, and particle B, particle 2, the second particle, is in state B. So we have particle 1, that's the first slot, particle 2 is the second slot, and this ket would say that particle 1 is in state A, particle 2 is in state B. 
And in that situation, you can compute this expectation value by simply sandwiching the expression x1 minus x2 squared between the two, between the bra and the ket, AB. Um, you can expand the binomial and uh, actually calculate the whole thing fairly directly. Now the fact x1 means that it, we're talking about the particle in slot 1. x2 means we're talking about the particle in slot 2. So when we go to evaluate these expectation values, the first term only involves the a state because it's x1 and that means it's the first slot and a is the first slot. Um, the, the first term, the b's, just uh, hit each other because there's no x2 in that first term in the expression. On the other hand, the second term is all about slot 2, and so it's the expectation value of x in the state corresponding to the second slot. And finally, the last term is the expectation value of x in the first slot and the expectation value of x in the second slot. So it turns out to be the product of the expectation value of x in state A and the expectation value of x in state B. We can march ahead here and uh, rewrite that. Notice that B on B is 1 and A on A is 1. So those bras and kets just sort of evaporate and you get the expectation value of x in state A, the expectation value of x squared in state A, plus the expectation value of x squared in state B, minus twice the expectation value of x in state A times the expectation value of x in state B. This would be the <coughs> expectation value of x minus x1 minus x2 squared in the distinguishable case. I want to notice that uh, if we had put particle 1 in state B and particle 2 in state A, we would have gotten the same answer because you can see that if you swap A and B in this expression, it doesn't change anything. So um, it doesn't. We, which particle is in state A and which particle is in state B is not relevant in terms of computing this particular expectation value. All that matters is that those that's the two different states they're in. Okay, so um, let's talk about indistinguishable particles. What's the difference here? Well, for indistinguishable particles, we've got to use a symmetrized or anti-symmetrized state for bosons or fermions, respectively. So if it's a boson, you get the plus sign, and if it's a fermion, you get the minus sign. But uh, you can write the whole thing out as just uh, AB plus or minus BA over root 2. So then what happens when we go to compute this same expectation value? Well, it gets a little more complicated because uh, psi sub i now uh, has two pieces. And since there's a psi sub i in the left-hand bra and a psi sub i in the right-hand ket, we end up with many terms, and not to mention the fact that the binomial has three terms. So there's a lots of terms we have to evaluate. We can expand the binomial again and rewrite this as the first term plus the second term minus two times that last bit. But each of these now has four pieces There's uh, because we have to expand all these bras and kets out. So it gets fairly complicated. Let's take the first term, x1 squared, and see how that comes out. We'll go ahead and expand that whole spiel. I want you to notice it's uh, similar to the thing we had before, except now we have to be a little careful about keeping track of which slot corresponds to which number. Notice that uh, the fact that we're talking about x1 means that it's only the first slot that counts in any of these terms. So we get x1 in state a squared, and then b on b gives us 1. And then the last term, we have x1 squared in, in state b, and a on a gives us 1. But notice in the two middle terms, uh, those guys go away because we get a on b and b on a. And I'm assuming in this case that the two states, a and b, are different. Um, if the two states are the same, then uh, we only have to worry about the boson case. And we can talk about that later. But I, for, for the moment, let's just imagine they're different. And, uh, and notice that uh, the same thing works out for particle 2, x squared of particle 2, because uh, it's a, basically the same algebra. You just have to plug in the other state. But, but when we, the last term, the one where x1 times, we get x1 times x2, it's a little different. So we should work that one out in. 
So uh, let's go ahead and expand that all out. And you'll see that uh, we have a new kind of term here that didn't exist before. We still have the x in state A and the x in state B. But now we have these cross terms where we have x taken between states A and B and x taken between states B and A. Now remember, these, these uh, states are all stationary states and x is an observable. So that means these, uh, these inner products have to be real numbers. The expectation values have to be real, even though they're two different states. So um, basically, uh, a on x on b and b on x on a are going to end up being the same thing. And uh, so we can simplify this quite a lot using the same kind of notation we had before. Um, Notice that when the whole thing comes out, it looks similar to what we had before, but we've got an extra term. The first three terms in the result are the same thing we had for the distinguishable particles, but this last term um, is due to the fact that the two particles are identical. And notice that the, the sign there is important. If they're bosons, we take the upper sign. If they're fermions, we take the lower sign, and the uh, the upper sign means that for bosons, the particles are closer together than they would be if they were distinguishable. And for fermions, it means the average distance between the two particles is greater. So they, they avoid one another more than they would otherwise. And the degree of avoidance has to do with the size of this so-called so exchange integral, the AXB, um, where the two states are both acting on the displacement operator. But uh, we kind of saw that in the demo. I hope you sort of recognized it in the demo, but also you can see it works out here mathematically. And uh, I also hope that you found this notation a little bit easier to, to see and to understand than the, uh, the detailed integral version that was in the text. But uh, we'll see you guys. I'm not going to be here next time. I'll be back on Friday. But uh, hopefully you guys are being well taken care of. Uh, There'll be another tutorial on Wednesday for you to work through. The tutorial for today is going to involve um, fermions in uh, three-dimensional infinite square well situations. Anyway, talk to you soon. Hey guys, welcome back. It's lesson two, Atom atoms, structure, and all that. This is going to be a quick lesson. We're going to start talking about helium. Helium has two protons, and two neutrons in the nucleus, and of course it has two electrons. So that makes it an interesting atom from our perspective. In the ground state configuration, both the electrons are in the n equals 1, l equals 0 state. So they're um, in a sort of hydrogen hydrogenish configuration. Let's talk about the Hamiltonian. The Hamiltonian has the kinetic energy of electron 1, that's the first term. Then it's got the potential energy between electron 1 and the nucleus. And then we have to add to that the kinetic energy of electron 2 and the potential energy of electron 2 relative to the nucleus. And then the last term here is the potential energy of interaction between the two electrons. So um, we can think about those terms uh, as being broken down into those pieces. But to solve the problem, the Schrodinger equation, which is that this Hamiltonian acting on the wave function is equal to some constant energy times the wave function, the eigenvalue problem, um, it's easiest to begin by ignoring this last term because it's a lot of trouble. Um, but if we ignore that term, then you'll notice that uh, the first uh, brace term, the, the term in braces there, is nothing other than the hydrogen Hamiltonian, except that there's a 2 in front of the electron charge. Um, and the same thing for the second term. One deals with electron 1, one deals with electron 2, and there are no terms in the Hamiltonian, ignoring that last one, that uh, deal with the interaction between the electrons. And so we can um, think of that as being two independent electrons that don't interact with each other at all. And that's nice because that means uh, we can factor the wave function, you know, this is the problem now, it's the eigenvalue problem. Hamiltonian 1 plus Hamiltonian 2 acting on the wave function is the energy times the wave function. But let's see what happens when we factor the wave function into a part that only depends on electron 1 and a part that only depends on electron 2. We can do that um, in this circumstance and see that that allows us to satisfy the Schrodinger equation 
um, because the Hamiltonian 1 only acts on wave function 1 and Hamiltonian 2 only acts on wave function 2. And we already know if those are hydrogenic wave functions, exact hydrogenic wave functions, and the Hamiltonians are exact hydrogenic Hamiltonians, that we already know the solution to that problem. And uh, it has an energy of 13.6 electron volts for each electron and uh, times 4 because of the 2 in the charge. When you go back and work out the energy, you'll notice that the 2 gets squared. And uh, so you end up with 4 times the energy. And um, so that means that when you add the two energies together, electron 1 and electron 2, you get about 109 electron volts compared to 13.6 electron volts for the hydrogen atom. And uh, if you measure the energy, it turns out to be about 80 electron volts. So we lost 30 in there somewhere. That means that the term we left out is not negligible, but we're not in crazy land either. We're, we're sort of close. Uh, we're going to find out soon enough how to fix this problem and various strategies to improve our approximation. But that doesn't come today. We'll deal with that a little bit later. Uh, but what I wanted to talk about is what happens if I have atoms with more than two electrons and how do we deal with that? The answer is um, as you add more protons and electrons you can no longer use the 1s shell. You have to go to the 2s shell and the 2p shell and so on. Um, and so for example for carbon there's two electrons in the n equals 1, l equals 0, and there's two electrons in the n equals 2, l equals 0, and two electrons in the n equals 2, l equals 1. So that's what those configuration things mean. But of course, uh, the total angular momentum of those electrons um, would be capital L, and the total angular momentum of the spin plus the orbital angular momentum of both of the electrons is going to be capital J. And the way folks have cooked up to represent that the condition of the total angular momentum and the total spin and the total orbital angular momentum is this uh, so-called term notation. So for example, if you have a system with a total spin of 1, a total orbital angular momentum of 1, and a total angular momentum, spin plus orbital, of 2, you'd write that as 3p2. The 3 comes from the spin of 1, the p comes from the l of 1, and the 2 comes from the j of 2. And given for a given configuration, for example carbon at the top of the screen, the term that has the lowest energy is 1, the one with the maximum total s consistent with the Pauli exclusion principle, it's got the highest L consistent with anti-symmetry that the overall wave function has to be anti-symmetric with respect to interchange of any two electrons. And uh, for a given subshell that's not more than half full, J is going to be L minus S. But if it is more than half full, J will be L plus S. And that's it. That's the whole lesson. I know there's a, that's a lot to chew there. You should read the section 5.2 on atoms and configurations and all. And you should also... Uh, Listen to this podcast carefully, and uh, we'll work on some board work in class, a couple of homework problems, and uh, these will ultimately become your homework as well. So we'll see you guys next time. Hope, uh, hope that wasn't too bad. Talk to you later. Welcome back, guys. It's time for Lesson 4. So we're going to talk about atoms and solids. I wanted to start from last time. We didn't quite get the board work done. So I wanted to remind you about problem 512 in the book, which was to determine the electronic configurations of some atoms and the corresponding angular momentum and term symbols. So uh, the table of atoms that we're dealing with uh, is right here, table 5.1 out of the book. And um, we were going to work on 1 through 10 for the configurations. But the interesting part is actually the term symbols, those guys on the right. So, um, and the other problem we talked about is to use Hund's rules to figure out which states of the possible states are the ground states, the lowest energy states. And those are the term symbols in the third column there, or I guess the fourth column <coughs> that starts with 2s1 half and so on. Now, uh, we worked out the term symbols for the first four because they're trivial. They only involve s states in which l is equal to zero, and so all you have is s and uh, it's quite obvious how those have to add up. 
The first really interesting case is boron. So I, I want to treat boron as an example, but carbon and nitrogen will work out in class today in detail at the board. But uh, let's, let's look at boron and see what it has to do. So what's the configuration of boron? It's got a helium shell, then it's got two electrons in, the, in a closed S shell, and one sort of trailing electron, a valence electron, in the 2P shell. Now what does that mean? Well, it means L is equal to 1 because it's a P electron, and it means uh, S is equal to a half because there's only one, and each electron has a spin of a half. And as you know, J then could either be 1 plus a half or 1 minus a half because you can either get the uh, <coughs> the long th th added together, the long or the jackknife when they're uh, subtracted. So you get uh, L plus S and L minus S as possible combinations. Remember when we had two electrons uh, in an S shell, you either have, uh, and you add the two spins together, that you either get S, uh, S total equals 1 or S total equals 0. It's the same idea. The two spins either add or subtract. But here now we've got an orbital and a spin angular momentum, so they either add or subtract. That's sort of how it works out. So what are the possible terms? Well, if J is 3 halves and L is 1 and S is a half, then uh, it would be a P state, since L is equal to 1. It would be a 2P state, because S is a half. And it would either be 2p 3 halves or 2p 1 half. So those are the possible term symbols. So that's pretty easy. It's actually not that complicated. It gets a little more interesting when you have more than one electron, which we will in class today. But that's the basic idea. Now the question is, of these two term symbols, which one is the ground state? Because uh, remember in the hydrogen atom, energy didn't depend on any of these things, spin, angular momentum, or whatever. But when you have multi-electrons, that electron-electron repulsion means energy now does depend on these properties. So how do we figure out which of these states has the lower energy? That's where Hund's rules come in, and there are three of them. The first rule is to maximize S. <coughs> well, in this problem, there's only one spin that's not in a closed shell, so S is already maximum, it's just a half. If we had more than one electron, of course you'd want to put the spins aligned, so you'd want to have two spins pointing up. Now if you're in an S shell and you have two spins, there's only room for two spins, so you can't have them both lining, pointing up because uh, you'd be violating the Pauli exclusion principle. So the rule is you need to maximize S, but you have to f also satisfy the Pauli exclusion principle. So in a, in a P shell, you can get three electrons pointing up. If you try to put a fourth one in, then uh, you, you can't put a fourth one in pointing up, and so one has to point down. It goes kind of like that. Anyway, uh, the second rule is you need to maximize L. Uh, so in this case, there is only one L. There is only one electron. L is fixed at one, so we can't really do anything about L. With more than one electron, of course, it becomes more interesting. And the typical issue you run into is you have to maintain the overall anti-symmetric property of the overall wave function. So if the spins are all aligned, that they would have a symmetric combination, and that would mean the L would have to be anti-symmetric. And in, in the case of multiple electrons, that can be a little tricky to figure out, but we'll see how to do it, at least for nitrogen and carbon in class today. But, uh, but that's the idea. You maximize L with the constraint that you have to satisfy the overall asymmetric property of the wave function. And finally, um, if the shell is greater than half full, the J you want to use is L plus S. But if it's less than half full, you want to use L minus S. Well, this shell is certainly less than half full. There's room for six electrons, and we only have one. So that means that uh, J is going to be L minus S, so the correct term is the 2P 1 half. That's kind of how it works. Okay, the other thing I want to talk about here is the exchange force. Um, we, uh, we talked about a potential board work problem. We never really did this. This actually is related to a homework problem in the book. 
where you'd write out the unnormalized wave function for the three cases of distinguishable fermion and boson when one particle is in the n equals 1 state and one particle is in the n equals 2 state. That's an interesting problem. It's not that hard to do. What I want to talk about now is a follow-up question. What if for those three cases, distinguishable, bosonic, and fermionic, you'd want to compute the expectation value of x1 minus x2 squared. In other words, the expected square difference between the position of the two particles in those three cases. Um, in order, and we talked about that a little bit, and I know I, I discussed how you calculate that with uh, the bra and ket notation. But what I want to do, just to extend it a little bit, is to talk about how would you handle this using some kind of a computer algebra system. So uh, you could use Sage or Mathematica or uh, you know Maxima. There's a bunch of different computer algebra systems out there. I happen to like Sage most of the time, and so I'm going to demonstrate with that. Okay, guys, I just wanted to point out that uh, you can use symbolic algebra to solve analytical problems in quantum mechanics. Here is the solution using a system called SAGE. Now, SAGE is a, uh, it's a computer algebra system that's free, which is why I like it. Um, we don't have a license for Mathematica in my place, and, uh, and so this is what I've come to use, but uh, of course you can use anything. You could use Mathematica or Maple. There's another free one called Maxima. Um, so, it, you know, whichever you like. The, the point is only that it is possible to use a computer algebra system to calculate things that are uh, complicated to calculate directly on with pencil and paper. Here's, here's an example. We have a wave function. I call it psi f, which is the fermionic wave function. It's the sine of n1 pi x over a times the sine of n2 pi x over a, x2 over a. We have x1 over a here. And we subtract from that the sine of n2 pi x1 over a times the sine of n1 pi x2 over a. So the point is, if you swap x1 and x2 in this wave function, it's anti-symmetric. And that means it's appropriate as a wave function for fermions, which are identical particles that have to have an anti-symmetric wave function. Uh, I just want to print out a solution. This is how you solve for the normalization constant. You say that when you integrate psi f star, psi f, in other words, psi f multiplied by itself, integrated uh, where x1 goes from 0 to a, and x2 goes from 0 to a, you need to get 1. So this is the integral, double integral, of uh, the product psi f squared, where x1 goes from 0 to a and x2 goes from 0 to a, and we're demanding that it be equal to 1, and we're solving for the unknown, the only unknown, of course, is the normalization constant. So we're going to print that out, but then I happen to know the answer is the square root of 2 over a for the normalization constant. Um, and so the, uh, I'm going to put that in, but here I'm going to calculate psi f times psi f times x1 minus x2 squared, and again x1 goes from 0 to a and x2 goes from 0 to a, uh, and print out the answer. So this is going to compute, using the correct normalization, the expectation value of x1 minus x2 squared. Then it's the same thing, but with the bosonic wave function. Here we get a plus. The normalization constant is the same and we get a plus here to make the wave function symmetric with respect to x1 and x2 and we print out the expectation value of exactly the same integral but now using the bosonic form of the wave function and finally in the distinguishable case there's no particular symmetry at all the normalization constant then is not the square root of 2 over a but just 2 over a okay and uh, and we print out the same expectation value for that one. If we go ahead and run this, uh, Sage, you can run it in a web browser, but I like to run it from the command line because I'm that kind of a person. Notice it printed out the solutions for AF, for AB, and for AD. And indeed, AF is the square root of 2 over A, AB is the square root of 2 over A, but the distinguishable case has a normalization of 2 over A. Notice that's just the square of the one-dimensional distinguishable particle, or the single distinguishable particle normalization function constant. But uh, I'll let you guys think about why this is a square root of 2 here for the 
boson and the fermion case, but the most important thing to notice is that the expectation value of the distance between the electrons, or fermions, we don't know that they're electrons, is 0.41a, whereas for the bosons it's 0.19a, and for the distinguishable particle it's 0.32a. So it's um, almost half an a for the fermions, a fifth of an a approximately for the bosons, and a third of an a for the distinguishable particles. So they're clearly different, and, uh, and that's what's interesting. Okay, so next we're going to move on from atoms. This, we're just getting a flavor of how this stuff works. We're going to move on and talk about solids. So first of all, we're going to start with the simplest possible treatment. We have non-interacting electrons in an empty box. So we're ignoring electron-electron repulsion, and we're ignoring the fact that the box is made of atoms. Uh, we introduce a concept of k-space. We get a Fermi energy out of that. And uh, we get a very important concept called the density of states. So I, I want to touch on all those things. Obviously, these are severe idealizations, but they're idealizations that are useful because it turns out that the dominant issue when you talk about electrons in a solid uh, doesn't turn out to be the atoms so much, especially in conductors, so like conducting metals. Uh, you can't really intelligently talk about insulators without discussing the atoms, but uh, anyway, let's move on. So the idea is, first of all, let's imagine this is the potential in the neighborhood of a single atom. It might look something like this. Uh, if I add more atoms, I get an overall potential that looks something like that. That might be what a one free electron would see inside of a, a solid. But if you average this over distances that are large compared to the atomic uh, spacing, you get an average potential that ends up looking something like that. And that's sort of the average potential we want to think about in dealing with the free electron model. So obviously on a microscopic scale it's not very accurate, but if you look on a large scale, uh, so for a long wavelength electron for example at a fairly low energy, this is going to be a reasonable approximation. And uh, we already know the answer. If you have a three-dimensional box like that, the, uh, you satisfy boundary conditions where the wave function goes essentially to zero at the boundaries, and you get uh, this result, which we're already familiar with. And what I want to do is start looking at counting the eigenstates. So I want you to imagine having a sort of a grid, and uh, the grid is in k space. So the horizontal direction is kx, and kx can be pi over the size in the x direction, 2 pi over the size, 3 pi over the size. So this, this would be sort of like pi over a, 2 pi over a, 3 pi over a. I've just generalized it a little bit to a cube that doesn't happen to have the same dimension on all three sides. Uh, what about in the uh, y direction? In the y direction, it's also uh, discrete k values, pi over l, 2 pi over l, 3 pi over l, like that. And finally, in the z direction, you get pi over l, 2 pi over l, 3 pi over l, and so on. Now let's imagine uh, counting, or enumerating, I guess, the, uh, the states that are available. Um, in the y direction, you could be in the pi over l y state, but uh, in the x direction, you could be in the pi over l x, the 2 pi over l x, the 3 pi over l x, and so on the 4 pi over LX, but don't forget, you could also uh, have the Y direction be 2 pi over LY, and the X direction be pi over LX, and so on. So you can imagine counting uh, more states that are available, and then finally, uh, we could start bumping up the Z direction. So you could have pi over L in the Z direction, and 2 pi over L, and so on. So you can see that in three-dimensional k-space, the states that are available correspond to these discrete points that can either be occupied or not. That's kind of the idea. And uh, we need to be able to count and calculate uh, what the probability of these different states being occupied and so on, and also to be able to count the total energy in the system depending on which states are occupied. That's kind of the idea. So I want to do another demo that sort of illustrates that in three dimensions. 
Hi guys, here's a, another cute little demo. Um, the idea here is to visualize k-space and there are two basic options uh, having to do with boundary conditions. So for example you can choose Dirichlet boundary conditions which are those we've been discussing where the wave function goes to zero at the edges of the three-dimensional box and an alternative is periodic boundary conditions where the wave function has to repeat every time it goes through a distance a. Um, I want to show you both of those to, so you can see the difference between the two. The other thing we can adjust is if uh, I have a limited set of 10 um, k values in each direction, so pi over a, 2 pi over a, 3 pi over a, up to 10 pi over a in the x direction, and then the same thing in the y direction and the same thing in the z direction, that'll give us uh, a thousand points in k space potentially. Uh, in one case, all of those are displayed, and it looks like a cube, and that would be all energies equals 1. The other case, down here, I'm calculating the energy of each point, and I'm only creating a representation of those points if they fall in the range that's less than the maximum for any one direction. So that'll give you an idea of what it looks like when you have uh, states that are limited by total energy. So when you're adding electrons to a solid at zero temperature, you know the electrons always go into the lowest states up to a maximum energy and that produces a sort of a octant of a sphere in Dirichlet boundary conditions or a full sphere in periodic boundary conditions and I just wanted to show you sort of how that works. So for now let's look at Dirichlet boundary conditions with all energies. I'll go ahead and run the program and uh, you'll see here that you get something that looks sort of like a cube. There it is. Let me go ahead and make that a little bit bigger. And uh, you can see that we have all the states all the way up to 10, 10 on each, in each direction. And uh, that would be k space. So this is the x direction, the y direction, and the z direction is blue. And it's kind of, kind of fun to look at, but I hope that gives you an idea. Notice that um, this is sort of a cubic array of possible states. Okay, now what I want to do is uh, change this to Dirichlet or to uh, non-Dirichlet. Let's look at periodic boundary conditions, and you can see the difference. Now notice that the k values are no longer restricted to be positive only, but they can be negative, and you still get a kind of a cube. But now it's ten points on a side, so there's only five on each side of the origin. So the it looks like the density in k space is reduced by a factor of two, but the density in energy is not any different because now um, for every point on this side, there's another point on that side. So the points are twice as far apart from each other, but now there's double the number. And so if you go th through and calculate the overall density, um, it turns out to be the same. Okay, let's see what happens if we... Uh, if we go to Dirichlet boundary conditions, but now we limit the energies to be within a certain range. This gives us a sort of a Fermi surface, and you can see that now we've got a kind of a octant of a sphere, and the spherical uh, surface is determined by the fact that the sum of the squares of the k values in the three different directions has to add up to something less than the maximum in this case. So you can kind of visualize the, uh, it's like you take an apple and slice it into halves in three directions. This is what you'd wind up with. Of course, if you go back to periodic boundary conditions, let's go ahead and do that. Then you get something that looks like a, a real sphere. So this is now a sphere in k-space. Now it looks a little chunky because I've only got 10, uh, potential values of k in each direction. So just to show you that it smooths out if you go to larger numbers of k, uh, I'm going to go ahead and double this so you can see what it looks like with twice as many. And uh, we'll blow that out a little bit and then uh, look at it. It's a little sluggish because it's a lot more points to manage. But notice that that's looking yeah, pretty darn spherical. Uh, in a real situation, of course, 20 times 20 times 20, what is that? That's going to be 8,000 um, points. So that's uh, we've multiplied by 8 the number of points in k-space that we have. Uh, in a real system, of course, you're going to have something like Avogadro's number of states. And so 
these the spacing here would be much too small to even see and uh, alright so that gives you an idea I hope of what case space looks like uh, when you're doing calculations I find it useful to literally visualize you know that space and maybe draw some pictures to help you think about it and uh, and so on so good luck okay and uh, finally uh, if we have time today there's another uh, board work we're going to do it's actually I, I just want to take some time and go over that tutorial the tutorial basically had a sequence of problems where you would work out the volume of a single state in k-space compute energy eigenvalues of those points in k-space and then calculate average like the total energy the Fermi energy the pressure stuff like that so that's what we'll be doing if we have time in class I'll try and go over some of the questions in that tutorial I'll try to remind you also to bring your tutorial as much as of it as much of it as you've worked out to class so we can we can discuss that all right have a good one hey guys welcome back it's time for more atoms and solids um, we're going to begin with carbon so we started talking about uh, boron and carbon and nitrogen and this stuff is uh, endlessly entertaining so uh, I wanted to there were numerous questions that were asked during class last time and I wanted to uh, take a few minutes to tell you the kind of the real story of how this stuff works we're going to need it anyway later when we get to perturbation theory so I figure why not get it done now so that's the idea so talking about carbon uh, it's got a helium shell and then it's got a filled 2s shell and then a partially filled 2p shell only two electrons there and what I want to point out is that you can understand what's going on with carbon completely only by working out the detailed angular momentum states involved so let's remind ourselves how that works first I want to remind you of this table from chapter 4 it's the terrible and hideous Klebsch Gordon coefficients uh, you basically need these guys anytime you need to add two angular momenta together and I'm going to explain to you how you can compute them yourself if you feel like it but they're difficult enough to compute and they're used often enough that uh, enterprising souls have created tables so that we don't have to compute them that's the idea but today we're adding two p electrons each p electron has an angular momentum of one we're adding those two angular momenta together to get a total angular momentum that could be one or two or could be zero and the question is exactly how does that come about well this table enables you to add two angular momenta together you'll notice in the upper left hand corner there's a spin one half t plus a spin one half and uh, you'll recognize that table from chapter four we we used it to get the two possible total angular momentum states for a uh, spin one half and th that was one and zero there was a one one plus one one zero one minus one and you'll notice that the vertical columns tell you how to compose the total spin the total angular momentum quantum states and uh, you can see that one one is simply uh, both spins pointing up plus one half plus one half but one zero is uh, a superposition of plus one half minus one half and minus one half plus one half and they're added together they're both positive and finally one minus one is both spins down minus a half minus a half but the zero zero superposition the singlet superposition is plus up down minus down up and the fact that there are halves there means that you need to use coefficients of one over the square root of two and minus one over the square root of two so every coefficient ha is really square rooted there's a little note about that at the top of the table and also notice the notation the total angular momentum states are labeled at the top in the horizontal direction and the uh, angular momentum states that go into the superposition are labeled on the side in the vertical orientation so uh, we'll see how that works here with the carbon so let's focus on the one plus one situation we're adding two angular momenta together each of which has a magnitude of one to form angular momenta that have magnitudes of zero one or two that's what that lower left hand table does let's move some stuff out of the way here and let's talk about the highest angular momentum state you could make and that's the two two state 
a total angular momentum of 2 with a z component of 2. The only way to make that is to make both angular momentum of the individual electrons plus 1. So you can see that uh, both of the one unit angular momentum are pointing up. Okay. Now, what if I want to know the 2, 1 state? In other words, it's got a total angular momentum of 2, but a z component of only 1. Uh, well, there's, there's two states of the individual electrons that could do that. There would be the 1, 0 plus the 1, 1, or the 1, 1 plus the 1, 0. But we don't know offhand what the superposition is going to be. Well, th to get that, we can apply the L minus operator. If you apply the L minus operator to the 2, 2 state, you'll get 2, 0. But you can see that you'll also get uh, 1, 0 plus 1, 1, and then you'll get plus 1, 1, 1, 0. So uh, let's see how that looks. It looks something like that. And you'll notice that the table tells you what the coefficient is on each of the individual eigenstates in order to make the total thing properly normalized. That's the idea. And properly weighted. So uh, <coughs> you could do this by hand by applying L minus, but somebody's already done it for you, and that's what this table is. What if you apply L minus again? Well, then you get a little bit of 1, 1, 1, 1 minus 1, 1, 0, 1, 0, and 1 minus 1, 1, 1. Notice these are the only combinations of the two uh, individual electron eigenstates that have a z component that adds up to 0. So you have to add a little bit of each of the possible combinations. And the fact that it turned out to be uh, in this proportion is due to the behavior of the L minus operator. You'll notice that there's two contributions to 1, 0, 1, 0, because I can hit L minus on the first electron in the first state of the 2, 1, or I can hit L minus on the second state of the 2, 1, on the second electron of the 2, 1. So there's two different ways to make that middle term, but there's only one way to make the outside terms. To, to make the first term, I have to hit L minus on the second electron of the first term of the 2, 1, and to make the last term, I have to hit L minus on the second term of the 2, 1, on the first electron of the 2, 1. Okay. Anyway, <coughs> if I hit L minus again, I get 2 minus 1. If I hit L minus again, I get 2 minus 2. And if I hit L minus on that one, I get nothing, because you can never have a z component that's greater in magnitude than the magnitude of the angular momentum itself. So I end up with five states uh, of total angular momentum 2 with the five possible z components. And you can see that those are composed of various combinations of the individual electron states. Now what I want you to look at is symmetry. If I swap the two electrons in any of these superpositions, uh, notice what happens. In the 2, 2 state, obviously if I swap them, I end up back where I was. In the 2, 1 state, I just exchange the two terms, but the total superposition remains unchanged. In the 2, 0 state, if I swap the two, the first and the last terms change places. The middle term doesn't make any difference because it's they're both in the same state. And so you can see that um, no matter what I do, these guys are all symmetric under interchange of the two particles. So if they're no good if I'm looking for an anti-symmetric state. In the state of carbon, we want the maximum spin, and the maximum spin occurs in the triplet. The triplet is uh, symmetric, and so I need the spatial part of the wave function, the angular momentum part of the wave function, has to be anti-symmetric, and you can see that uh, these guys are all symmetric, so it's no good. The L equals 2 cannot be used for carbon. So I've got to look further. So let's figure out what is the, uh, what about the angular momentum of 1 states. Now, in this case, uh, I need to, the maximum z component of angular momentum I can get, if the total angular momentum is 1, is 1, 1. So I've got to start with the 1, 1, and it's got to be orthogonal to the 2, 1, and you can see that the only combination of 1, 1 and 1, 0, which is what I need to get a z component of 1 that's orthogonal to 2, 1, is the same thing with a minus sign. So 1, 1 has to be orthogonal to 2, 1. If I apply L minus to that, I get 1, 0. If I apply L minus to that, I get 1, minus 1. Now I want you to look at these three states and notice what happens when I interchange particles. They all have anti-symmetry. That is, the, under interchange of the two particles, they are anti-symmetric, so they satisfy 
the Pauli exclusion or the uh, yeah the Pauli exclusion principle. Since we have a symmetric spin state, we need an anti-symmetric spatial wave function, and these guys do it. Just for completeness, I'll go ahead and uh, try to figure out what is the zero zero state because there is a zero zero state in this system. You can see from the Klebsch-Gordon coefficient table, it's um, it's got to be that superposition. You know that it has to be orthogonal to both 1, 0 and 2, 0. And, uh, it, but it's got to be a superposition of these three states. And so it turns out this is the only orthogonal combination of 1, minus 1, 0, 0, and minus 1, 1. That's, uh, that's orthogonal to 1, 0 and to 2, 0. So that's the idea. Um, and that's why carbon ends up with L equals 1, not L equals 2. And, uh, and since it's half full, it means that J has to be um, L minus S. S is 1, L is 1, so I think J turns out to be 0 in carbon. But uh, I don't have that slide in front of me, so I'm, <laughs> I'm not positive of that. But that, that's basically how it works. OK, so uh, what about nitrogen? Well, for nitrogen, we've got three electrons. And what I'd like to do is to point out that uh, we can use our understanding of the carbon situation to work out nitrogen. So let's see how that turns out. For, first of all, I want to point out that there's an easy way to construct an anti-symmetric wave function in general. It's called a Slater determinant. So if I have a bunch of quantum states, A, B, C, D, E, and I have a bunch of particles, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, or whatever, and I want to form an anti a totally anti-symmetric combination of the wave functions using those particles, I can form what's called a Slater determinant. I put the wave functions in the columns, and I put the particles in the rows, and then I uh, just simply calculate this determinant. So for example, if we want to put three electrons in the L equals 1 state, uh, but with different values of m sub l, 1, 0, and minus 1, we would, uh, we'd put them in something like this. So that would mean, what have I got? I've got uh, electron 1 in uh, the plus state, electron 1 in the 0 state, electron 1 in the minus 1 state is the first row. The second row is electron 2 in the up, electron 2 in the 0, electron 2 in the down, and so on. If I multiply all that out and use the normal rules of matrix algebra, okay, I get uh, the first electron is up, and I multiply that by the second electron is at 0, the third electron is at minus 1, minus the second electron is at minus 1, and the third electron is at 0. And I uh, do that for all three rows using the normal rules of matrix of determinant calculation, or whatever. Now I can uh, go ahead and multiply that all out, and I get this hideous mess. But uh, basically, it tells you that there is a superposition of the three electron states that is totally anti-symmetric. And this would be the spatial part of the wave function, because the uh, spin part is going to be symmetric in view of the fact that we've maximized the spin. All three spins have to be up. And there's only then the only way to make all three spins up is if it's symmetric. So, uh, so that's one way to calculate. But the question is, what's the angular momentum of that state? We know what the state is. That's got to be the angular momentum state of the three electrons. But, but it's hard to look at that and know what angular momentum it corresponds to. So what I want to point out is that uh, we can work out the, uh, I'm going to claim that that's the 0, 0 state, that that's the total angular momentum of 0 and a spin of 0. And what I want to show is that uh, we can use the um, Klebsch-Gordon coefficients to, to basically the approach we had before to demonstrate that. Let's see how that works. OK, so this is the 0, 0 state. Um, and we want to form this. Here's the idea. If we combine the first two electrons, we need them to be anti-symmetric. The only way to make the first two electrons anti-symmetric is if they're in a 1, L equals 1 state of some kind. Um, any L equals 1 state will be anti-symmetric. So the idea is, if we 
let the first electron in this three electron set be the first slot in the zero zero state and let the second slot be filled by the two electrons forming an L equals one state together. So the idea is the last two electrons we know have to be in some superposition of 1, 1, 1, minus 1, and 1, 0, because those are the only anti-symmetric states that we can track down. And we put those in as the second angular momentum in the full 3 electron 0, 0 state. Okay? That's the idea. And we notice that if you go back and look at the determinant structure from the Slater determinant, what do you get? You get um, the uh, first electron in the 1 state, the second electron in the 0 state, the third electron in the negative state. But um, if you look at what you get from the first term of this overall superposition, we get the first electron in the 1 state, the second electron in the 0 state, and the third electron in the minus 1 state. That would be the result of plugging the 1 minus 1 of the 2 electrons into the first term of the 0, 0. And uh, notice that the 1 over the square roots of 2 and the 1 over the square roots of 3 multiply to give us the 1 over the square root of 6 in the original Slater determinant. So uh, we haven't exactly proved this is the only way to do it, although it does turn out to be that way. Um, but it at least demonstrates that uh, what we have constructed using the Slater determinant is in fact a zero zero state made up of the uh, first electron in a superposition of 1, 1, 1, 0, and 1, minus 1, and the other two electrons in superpositions of 1, 1, 1, 0, and 1, minus 1 themselves, so that the total angular momentum ends up being zero. So this would be the so-called jackknife situation. If you multiply it all out, you get exactly the same thing we had before. Okay, so that is why, or that is one way to look at the reason nitrogen ends up being an orbital angular momentum of zero, carbon ends up being an orbital angular momentum of one. And uh, I know this stuff is nuts. We will get better at it as we get more practice. Okay. Let's talk about a periodic potential. One way to make a periodic potential in one dimension is just as a superposition of delta function potentials. We had some experience with delta function potentials last semester in chapter two. Um, within a unit cell, there is no potential at all. So we're just talking about a free particle. That means that it needs to be some kind of superposition of sine and cosine. There is a thing called Bloch's theorem, which says that if you have a periodic potential, the wave function in any other place has to be periodic. In other words, if you've got the wave function at point x and you want to know what it is one unit spacing away, you can take the wave function at point x and just multiply it by this complex exponential using a real value of capital K. So capital K is sometimes called the crystal momentum. It's uh, it's produced by solving a transcendental equation typically and we're going to see how that comes out. If we if you apply the boundary conditions at the delta function just like we did in chapter 2 you end up with an equation that looks like this um, and notice that this means that uh, if you tell me capital K I can solve this transcendental equation to find the little k uh, or the other way around if I solve this transcendental equation if I put in a little k this tells me capital K. So this gives me a relationship between the crystal momentum and the k value, but the k value is uh, determines the energy, right? Determines the energy of the thing. So uh, of course Griffiths likes to parameterize these things, so he defines k a to be z, and he defines m alpha a over h bar squared to be beta. So beta is a measure of the strength of the potential and the crystal spacing, the unit cell spacing. Um, you can think of it as a strength parameter, a geometry parameter. And uh, Z, of course, is related to the energy. So let's, uh, let's do a little demo to see how this equation actually produces solutions. 
Okay, so this is the <coughs> equation that Griffiths comes up with. This is the equation for the, the, uh, the cosine of capital K times A. And I'm letting x be Griffiths z, which is little k times a. And uh, you notice the function is a cosine. And then it's the sine of x divided by x, which uh, sometimes is called a sinc function. But it's the sum of those two guys that has to be equal to the cosine of big k times a. And I've got a dial here where I can adjust the value of beta. So I can make beta big and small. One thing to notice is that if beta is 0, that means that I get rid of the potential altogether, that the function stays always within the bounds of minus 1 and plus 1, which means there are solutions for all values of little k. But if beta gets to be big, notice that the function grows. I think Griffiths uses 10 in, in the book, in the diagram in the book. Um, in that case, this function exceeds the bounds of minus 1 and 1, and there's no value of capital K that can match the value of this function. And so these points where the function exceeds 1 or mi minus 1 are forbidden. There is no solution in that region. And since the energy depends on little k, that means that these are regions of uh, forbidden energy in the final system. Uh, and so this is what gives rise to the so-called gaps. So in a real solid, there are energy gaps that uh, electrons in those solids aren't allowed to occupy. And those gaps uh, have to, if, if let's say we have a band of energy levels, so the set of solutions, since the capital K is quantized to have only particular values, um, in the periodic boundary conditions, uh, basically n times the uh, k times the lattice spacing has to be 1. So uh, that means that's not quite right. It has to be an integer. So uh, it means that capital K has, it has a discrete set of possible values. So you can imagine if you zoomed in here, a set of horizontal values here of k that would correspond of big k that would correspond to solutions that have a certain value of little k and so this this range of values of little k between here and here corresponds to a band of energies and then there's a gap and there's another band of energies and there's a gap there's another band of energies in a real solid if you have a band that's full of electrons and a band that is empty of electrons then in order to get from the full band to the empty band, which are, happen to be called the conduction band and the valence band, for example, you have to jump across a gap. In an insulator, uh, that gap is big. And because this band is full, all the positive and negative k values are gobbled up. There's no possibility of conduction. You'd end up with an insulator. Um, if the gap is not too big, then you have a semiconductor. And if there is no gap, um, or if a band is half full, um, then you'd have a metal. So because th there would be no energy required to go from uh, <coughs> a full band to, well, a full state to an empty state. Anyway, that's the idea. Now, the question is, what do these bands actually look like? Uh, so I cooked up a little Python program. Here is the function that you recognize. And I went ahead and took its derivative. So this is the derivative of the function. And I started out, I just picked some z values that were convenient. I create an array of n values that goes from minus n over 2 to plus n over 2. I picked n to be 1,000. And then I created the uh, large k, I'm going to call it kappa, the large k array, to be integer multiples of 2 pi over big N. And the idea is that uh, uh, these are going to be crystal momenta, so-called crystal momenta. Then, I don't know if you're familiar with Newton's method. It's a way of finding zeros. You basically, uh, we, we can talk about it a little bit in class if you have questions. But basically, you give, you give it a function and the value you want that function to have. You pass in the, the derivative of the function, the function primed. The uh, uncertainty you're permitting the, or the difference between the value of the function that you're willing to uh, permit, and then a starting place to evaluate the function. And basically what you do is you 
evaluate the function at the starting place, you figure out its derivative at that location, and you project where what z would have to be in order to make its value 0, assuming that that derivative is, is good, uh, then you reevaluate and keep going. And you just keep, a, keep a zooming in until you find the place where the function is very, very nearly equal to the value that you wish. As long as the derivative doesn't go to 0, the thing is pretty well behaved. Um, if the derivative goes to zero or becomes very small, it's it's not so good. But it turns out it's okay for this application. And uh, then what I'm going to do is go through all the values of kappa and calculate the cosine of kappa times a, and then use Newton's method to find the value of z that satisfies the transcendental equation, and then calculate the energy at that location and throw it in a list, and then we can graph it. Then we're going to graph kappa versus the energy for the three bands. Let's see. Let's see how that goes. If we run the program, we get this is the energy for the uh, lowest energy band, and then here's the next energy band, and here's the highest energy band. Uh, one thing I want to point out is that if I zoom in here and look at this energy band right around the origin, so I'll have to zoom in twice probably. There you go. You can see that near the origin, this thing is very nearly quadratic. And what that means is um, the energy goes like k squared, which is the correct behavior for a free particle. So for low energies in this band, the energy of the electron in the band is very nearly the same as a free particle. But when you go out to higher energies, the, uh, the behavior changes, and you don't have free particle behavior. So what this means is, is the as k gets bigger, the energy increases uh, in a quadratic way. Here, as k gets close to a band edge, it starts to behave kind of strangely, where it sort of maxes out. Um, and here, if you are in this band, as k gets bigger, the energy actually drops. So that's uh, quite strange. And uh, you'll have to take a course on solid state physics to understand what all that means. But it's fun to think about. And uh, if you have questions, of course, I'm, I'm totally happy to talk. Anyway, I think that's all for today, so we'll see you guys next time. Hi guys, welcome back. It's time for Lesson 6. We're going to start looking at statistical physics. Um, I know you guys just finished a course in thermodynamics, so I'm not going to go over all this in detail, but we will have some board work today where you'll get to exercise your combinatorics a little bit. But let's, let's talk about three particles in an infinite square well. Let's suppose I have three particles in an infinite square well of size A, and one of them is in a state capital A, one of them is in state capital B, and one of them is in state capital C. Uh, and the question is, how are they sharing the energy? Let's say they have a total energy that's fixed. Well, since the energy is proportional to the sum of the squares of the state numbers, then it means that the sum of the squares of the state numbers has to be constant. Now let's just take a random number. Actually, it's not completely random. Because it turns out if, if the sum of the squares of the states is 363, there's uh, several different ways to achieve that. You can have n a, n b, and n c all equal to 11. You could have two of them equal to 13 and one equal to 5, or two equal to 1 and 1 to 19. Or you could have 1, 5, 1, 7, and 1, 17. So on the board today, we're going to be working through the various combinations of these guys to see what happens when we're dealing with distinguishable particles, fermions, and bosons. So that'll be on the board today. There is a, uh, a couple of conclusions you can make in general. If you have a total number of particles is capital N, and you've got N1 in state 1, and N2 in state 2, and N3 in state 3, and so on, and the degeneracy of each of the states is d1, d2, and d3, then the total number of ways you can have those particles distributed in that fashion turns out to be this monstrous looking product if the particles are distinguishable. On the other hand, if they're fermions, there are some combinations that can't happen. And as a result, the number of ways you can combine the particles is uh, diminished from what you'd get for distinguishable particles. And finally, if they're bosons, then it turns out the number of ways is also different. And we're actually going to revisit this formula, discover how it comes about in detail when we talk about solids here in a little bit. I am going to work through the case of the Einstein model of solids in some detail. So um, 
what is the occupation number or the expected number of particles in the nth state? It turns out it depends on the energy of the state and the degeneracy of the state. And it turns out it depends on something called beta, which we'll discover is related to the temperature, and another number, which is basically a normalization constant that's needed to get the total number of particles to work out right. If the particles are distinguishable, the formula ends up looking like this. If they're fermions, it's a little different. And if they're bosons, it's a little different. So the idea is the expected or the, the most likely distribution of particles in states depends also on the nature of the particles. And uh, Griffiths does a lovely job of describing where these formulas come from and how they come about. So I'm not going to repeat all that in the slides, but uh, we can talk about it in class if you're interested. All right, so I want to work through an example in detail that shows sort of how this works at an elementary level. And uh, the idea is if you have a solid that's made up of atoms, at some, in, in some very elementary way, you can think of each atom as a quantized simple harmonic oscillator. But a three-dimensional symmetrical quantized simple harmonic oscillator is really just three one-dimensional simple harmonic oscillators because the potential is proportional to the sum of the squares of x squared, y squared, and z squared. And so the uh, Schrodinger equation factors into three separate equations and each one looks like a one-dimensional simple harmonic oscillator. And uh, this, by the way, is an approach that's used in an elementary textbook called Matter and Interactions, introductory textbook by Bruce Sherwood and Ruth Chabay. Um, and I'm just stealing their idea. I think it's a lovely plan and uh, it's a nice approach that I'm uh, familiar with and I think it helps students understand where this stuff comes from. So I want you to imagine we have an atom in a solid that can be approximated as three independent quantum simple harmonic oscillators. And the idea is let's imagine for a moment that it at this moment it happens to have four quanta of energy. That is that it's got, if you look at the three different directions, the total energy, including the three different directions, adds up to four h bar omega. Um, how many ways are there to distribute four quanta of energy among the three? Well, you could have one in the n equals four state, and, or, uh, and two in the n equals zero state. You could have the middle one in the four and the two in the zero, the outside ones in the zero, or you could have the right hand one in the four and the other two in the zero. That's one possible combination. But you could also have um, these guys uh, in different combinations of three, zero, and one, or you could have two, two, and zero, or two, one, and one. So, and if that, that turns out to be all the different ways you can do it, that adds up to 15, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and so there are 15 ways, and those are called microstates. So it turns out there's 15 ways to distribute four quanta among three oscillators. But uh, each of those ways, we're going to call that a microstate. And um, in statistical thermodynamics, the idea is that every possible microstate is equally likely. And in the end, we really don't care about the microstates. All we care about is the stuff we can see and measure. And those are called macrostates. So uh, a macrostate is simply a, not a particular way of distributing the four, but the fact that there are four quanta there distributed in some way. That's kind of the idea. OK, now suppose we have two atoms. Each of them has three oscillators. But uh, let's say they're connected in some way. So they share a total amount of energy, like, for example, four quanta, but that at any given moment, one of them could have four and the other could have zero, or the first one could have three and the other one could have one, and so on. How can that energy get distributed between the atoms? So for example, let's say how many ways can one have four and the other have none? Well, there's only one way to have none, and there's 15 ways to have four. So that means that there are 15 ways of one having four and the other having none. But what if one had one and the other had three? Well, you can work out, just as we did, the number of ways of having three. It turns out there are 10 ways. How many ways are there of having one? Well, an atom has three directions. So it could either be one in the x direction, one in the y direction, or one in the z direction. That would be the only way to have, there are three ways to have one. 
Well, there's 10 ways to have 3 and 3 ways to have 1. So altogether, there's 30 ways that one atom could have 1 and the other atom could have 3. Does that make sense? If you keep doing that, of course, they could each have 2 and so on. If you keep working that out with two atoms, each with three oscillators and a total of four quanta, you end up with a, uh, a picture that looks something like this. There's 15 ways of the first atom having zero and the other atom having four, and there's 30 ways of the first atom having one and the second atom having three. It turns out there's uh, 36 ways of both of them having two, and so on. And so you can see that the most likely situation is the one that has the most possibilities, and that turns out to be each of them getting two. Is there a way to come up with a formula that would enable us to reproduce these numbers even if the number of atoms and the number of oscillators was, was larger? And yeah, it's actually Griffith's equation for bosons because these oscillators behave like bosons um, since there's no restriction on the number of quanta you can have in any one uh, oscillator, then uh, these things are basically bosonic in nature. And uh, the formula turns out to look like this. Um, it's the number of quanta plus the number of oscillators minus one factorial divided by the number of quanta divided by the number of oscillators minus one. And we'll talk about in class how, where that actually comes from. There's a nice picture you can use to convince yourself that that's correct. Um, but basically, it's uh, straightforward mathematically, at least, to compute how many combinations there are. So suppose we did the same project, but now we used 300 oscillators in one clump of material and 200 oscillators in a different clump of material and calculated the number of ways of one of the, one of the clumps of material having so many quanta and the other clump of material having so many quanta, we'd get a graph that looks something like this. Um, what you have there is the fraction of um, quanta Let's say, it, oh, this is an example with 100 quanta altogether distributed between these 500 oscillators. And the most likely situation is when 60 of the quanta is in the first chunk of material and 40 are in the second chunk of material. So we're looking at the number of quanta of energy in the first chunk as a function, uh, as the horizontal axis, and the number of combinations of uh, ways of doing that as the vertical axis. Notice that the numbers here are dramatically larger. The numbers go up to 7 times 10 to the 114th uh, number of microstates. So it becomes dramatically larger, and this is with only 500 oscillators. Uh, in a real chunk of material, of course, you've got 10 to the 23 oscillators, and so the distribution of microstates becomes very, very sharp. If you take the logarithm of the number of microstates and you graph that, it also has a peak at the same place. Um, notice something about the logarithm of the number of microstates. There's the, the omega one is the number of ways of putting Q1 oscillators in block one, and omega two is the number of ways of putting Q2 oscillators, or Q2 quanta, excuse me, let me start that over again. Omega 1 is the number of ways of putting Q1 quanta in block 1. And omega 2 is the number of ways of putting Q2 quanta in block 2. Uh, notice that if there are zero quanta in block 1, there's only one way to do that. But the natural log of 1 is 0. So the natural log of omega goes to 0 when the number of ways of doing putting that many quanta in is one. But uh, as you go to the right, as you increase the number of quanta in block one, the number of microstates goes up. But at the same time, the number of microstates for block two goes down. It starts at a maximum when you have 100 quanta in block two, and it goes to zero when you get uh, only zero quanta in block two, because there would be only one way to put zero quanta in block two, and that would have a natural log of omega two of zero. But how many ways are there to put uh, 
q1 quanta in block 1 and q2 quanta in block 2, it's going to be omega 1 times omega 2. Because for every configuration of the q1 quanta in block 1, there are omega 2 configurations of the q2 quanta in block 2. And so overall, it's the product. So we're looking at the natural log of the product of the two. But the interesting thing about natural logs, of course, is that the natural log of the product is the sum of the natural logs. So if you think of the natural log of omega 1 as a number and the natural log of omega 2 as the number, the natural log of the product is just the sum of those two numbers. So you add those two curves together to get the total or the natural log of the product. And you can see that the equilibrium is the point where those two curves added together has a maximum. Okay, so it turns out we define something called entropy. Entropy is related to the number of microstates that are available in a certain macrostate. So in other words, for a given total energy it's, uh, or distribution of energy, it's the number of ways you can have that configuration. We use the natural log of the number of states because it matches, the natural log of the number of states actually matches the historical notion of this concept of entropy. And uh, so we calculate the entropy as a constant called the Boltzmann constant times the natural log of the number of microstates. The Boltzmann constant you're familiar with, I'm sure it's got units of joules per Kelvin. Um, some folks use entropy in terms of information theory and they usually use the natural log base 2 of the number of microstates, and they call it the information. Information and entropy are exactly the same thing. So what happens if, uh, if our system begins out of equilibrium? Well, let's say we had 90 quanta in the first block and 10 quanta in the second block. Well, it's more likely that it's going to move toward the equilibrium configuration because there's more ways of doing that. And since there's more ways of doing it, that means that uh, if you choose at random a particular configuration, you're vastly more likely to find yourself at equilibrium than in any other place. I also want you to notice that uh, in order to reach equilibrium, the condition is that the slopes of those two curves be equal at equilibrium. Because notice that... Uh, if the slopes are not equal, then that means that it pays to move in the direction um, of the line that has the greater slope. So if, if we're, let's say we were down at Q1 equals 20, the curve for S1 has a greater slope than the curve for S2. That means moving to the right increases the entropy more by increasing S1 then it decreases S2. But if you reach the point where the two slopes are equal, then you don't buy anything by moving to the left or to the right because the increase and the decrease is going to be the same either way. And so that's the point where you're, you're balanced between the two directions. And so the condition for equilibrium is that uh, ds dq is equal for the two objects. But uh, it turns out the SDQ is directly related to the energy, or to the temperature, excuse me, the SDQ. And in fact, we're going to define temperature to be the reciprocal of the slope of this curve of S versus energy. Now, remember, Q is the number of quanta, but each quanta is h bar omega. So DE is h bar omega DQ. So they're directly related to one another. On the other hand, this idea of specific heat capacity is that uh, if you throw some heat into a system, its temperature changes and the heat capacity is related to the rate at which the um, energy goes up, or the energy required to change the temperature by some fixed amount. So the way you find the heat capacity statistically is you throw in one quantum of energy, you calculate the change in the entropy, uh, on either side of that number of quanta and then you calculate the change in the entropy to get the temperature and then you use the uh, change in the energy for a small change in temperature to get the heat capacity and if you do that process which we pro so anyway when you work all that out it turns out you get a fairly simple result at low temperatures um, the heat capacity goes to zero at high temperatures it reaches a limit it works out to be about three Boltzmann constants per atom in terms of um, 
joules per Kelvin per atom. So um, that's kind of a neat universal result, and we're going to check it out in class today. But uh, And of course, at low temperatures, the heat capacity approaches zero in a way that's predicted pretty well by this very simple model. There are more sophisticated models that do an even better job at low temperature, but the fact that the Einstein model does as well as it does is, is pretty amazing. Now, finally, we're going to do a fun topic. It turns out I, I want to start working on our quantum computing business and how you actually build quantum computers. And so I want to introduce the idea of an ion trap. An ion trap is basically, this is a particular kind of ion trap called a quadrupole trap, where you have uh, four electrodes. Two of them are positive and two of them are negative. And you notice that at any given moment, the field that's produced is unstable. That is, there's a force that tends to push the ion toward the center along one direction, but it tends to pull the ion away in the other direction. The trick of the ion trap is to have the field oscillate quickly so that the, f the f two directions change places periodically. And uh, here's an example of a, such a trap that's actually been built. And uh, what I'm going to show in a little bit is a demo. Actually, I'll probably show it in class. We'll do a demo of a Visual Python program that illustrates the actual trajectory that this thing has. And uh, so that just gives you a little uh, teaser to think about how it all works out. And, uh, and we'll see how it, how it uh, looks in Visual Python in class. We'll see you then. Okay, welcome back. It's time for lesson seven. We're doing some more statistical mechanics before we wrap up this block. Um, we're going to start with ion traps. I'm going to do that ion trap demo I promised last time but never got around to. We're going to wrap up our discussion of the statistics of different types of particles. And in particular, we'll, um, we'll look at a couple of Monte Carlo demos that I cooked up to illustrate the behavior of fermions, bosons, and distinguishable particles. And finally, uh, Probably in class today, we'll talk about how you generate random distributions of numbers of various types, not just uniform distributions, but other exponentials and cosines and sines and stuff like that. So that's what's online. Let's start with the demo of the ion trap. We already talked about this in the slides for last time, but let's, uh, let's see what they really look like. Okay, let's see if this works. Um, I want to run a little Python application that uh, simulates this ion trap. So what we have here are the four conductors. Two of them are positive and the other two are negative. Every half cycle then they switch. These guys become positive, these guys become negative. This is the origin of the coordinate system and that little yellow guy is my ion. So I'm going to start the time and I want you to notice that first thing you see is that the ion wiggles very quickly. That's the high frequency response to the alternating electric field, but that there's also a low frequency response, which is sort of the average uh, motion over many of the short or the high frequency cycles. Um, and you can see that the thing is bound to a region near the origin. It, uh, it feels a net restoring force back toward the axis of the system. And then there's also uh, an electric field a uh, convergent electric field along the longitudinal direction that keeps the thing confined in the in the z direction and uh, and you can see that it wiggles around. Now the thing I haven't explained is that if you apply a strong slightly detuned laser field that that produced that has the net effect of producing a damping force. It, uh, it causes a little bit of radiation pressure, which pushes the thing away from the origin a little bit, but it also causes a damping force. And uh, what I plan to do is to add little bits and pieces of the theory in every couple of lessons, so that by the end of the semester, we have a fairly complete picture of how uh, you can build an actual quantum computer using ions in one of these traps and they can communicate with one another and you can actually do calculations. So you can see the damping force is sort of causing the thing to die down now and uh, it's slowly approaching the origin and, uh, and that's how it works. Okay, now let's go back to discussing uh, different kinds of particles and the number of ways we can distribute them. So for distinguishable particles, the big Q here is the number of ways 
that you can distribute capital N distinguishable particles among a set of states where you have uh, little n can be any number from 1 to infinity and big N sub little n is the number of particles in that particular state, the little nth state, and d sub little n is the degeneracy of the little nth state. So that's the idea. Um, in the distinguishable case, you get this monstrosity. For fermions, it uh, looks still fairly monstrous, but the difference is you can't put more than d sub little n fermions into, any, uh, into the nth state, and so there's a limit, whereas for distinguishable particles, there's no such limit. For bosons, there's not a limit either, except that for bosons, uh, if you put five bosons in a, uh, a level that can hold 10, then it turns out there's, a, there's only so many ways you can do it, but th the, uh, you can't count. There aren't as many states there as there are for distinguishable particles, because if you've got um, 311, for example, that's the same as 113 or 131 and so on because you can't tell which particles in in which state exactly that's kind of the idea anyway there are fewer bosonic states available than there are for distinguishable particles because you can't they don't have labels so putting three bosons there's only one way to put three bosons in one state right you can't their, their order doesn't matter because the order doesn't make any sense because bosons are indistinguishable particles okay very good um, the whole idea is that for you want to find the combinations, the distribution of values of big N sub little n that maximize Q. But there are some constraints. For example, we are assuming that there are a fixed number of particles, that the sum of the big N sub little n's has to add up to big N. If you've got five bosons, you've got five bosons. You can put them in different states four of them in one and one in the other, or three in one and two in the other, and so on, but they still have to add up to five all the time. And the same way with the energy. If you take the number of particles in the first state times the energy of the first state, plus the number of particles in the second state times the energy of the second state, and add all those up, you've got to get a total amount of energy that's not allowed to vary. We're not allowed to create and destroy energy. We can just move it around by moving particles around. Um, <clears throat> but uh, the idea is that those two constraints we want to maximize Q given that we have to maintain those constraints. So one way to do that is to maximize this quantity that I'm going to call capital G, which is the natural log of Q plus alpha times the difference between N and the sum of the N's plus beta times the difference between the total energy and the sum of the N's times the corresponding energies. Notice that if the constraints are satisfied, the coefficient of alpha and the coefficient of beta are going to be zero here. This is a trick that was invented by a fellow named Lagrange. You've probably heard of him before. But the idea is you take the derivative of g with respect to n sub little n, and uh, you set that equal to zero. Then you take the derivative of g with respect to alpha and the derivative of g with respect to beta and set that equal to zero, and that gives you your uh, constraints and it maximizes q. So the idea is you think of alpha and beta as kind of variables in a space where uh, the n sub little n's can vary and the alpha and the beta can vary, but the derivative with respect to g the derivative of g with respect to alpha, beta, and n sub n all have to be zero. So that produces some equations that you can solve. If you do solve those, you get these three results that uh, big N sub little n is equal to this first expression for distinguishable, to this next expression for fermions, and to this last expression for bosons. If you divide n sub n by the degeneracy of each corresponding level, you get what's called an occupation probability or an occupation number. The expected occupation number of a particular level is how much each degenerate state, how many particles each degenerate state is expected to have, and uh, it's called its occupancy. Okay, and uh, so what are the Lagrange multipliers? Well, alpha 
it turns out to be basically a normalization constant. It's related to something called the chemical potential. So, um, <coughs> and beta turns out to be, it's related to the energy, and it's also uh, called, or related to, the temperature. So if we redefine the chemical potential to be minus alpha times the Boltzmann constant times the temperature, and we define the temperature to be 1 over the Boltzmann constant times beta, then we can plug all that stuff back in, and we get the occupation number for the Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution, for the Fermi-Dirac distribution, and for the Bose-Einstein distribution. And the mu in this guy is now the chemical potential. It was basically put in there instead of alpha. So that's the idea. And these are the guys you'd use to go and calculate things like uh, the uh, expectation value of the energy of a particle, or the pressure, or the compressibility of a material. And based on uh, the distribution of, of energies and so on. So we'll do that in class today. We're going to use the Fermi-Dirac version to estimate the compressibility of uh, a metal at room temperature, say. And the occupancy of the Bose-Einstein distribution we can use to estimate the heat capacity of a material at room temperature. Now, what I want to show you now is a couple of demos I've cooked up that illustrate how these distributions can come about as a result of a Monte Carlo procedure called the Demon algorithm. So uh, I'll describe the Demon algorithm here and you can see how it works. Okay, here's a little example of the uh, Bose-Einstein. This is a graph. The X is the energy. Uh, y is the occupation number basically and uh, what you have here is the comparison between the Bose-Einstein distribution, uh, which I, I'm showing here for alpha equals zero, which means that this thing, uh, if you plug in x equals zero, then you get uh, one minus one, this thing blows up. So it's super exponential for small values of energy. Um, on the other hand, the Fermi-Dirac distribution is just a plain old exponential. It falls off nicely. I'm sorry, the Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution, the classical distinguishable particle distribution, is uh, just a simple exponential. And then the Fermi-Dirac distribution is this one. It starts at one at low energies and then it drops to about a half at uh, when um, the energy is equal to the Fermi energy and then it drops off. Notice that at high energies all these guys approach one another. So if the energy is much greater than the temperature, they all basically look exponential. What that means is you can ignore this one down here in the in the denominator and they all look just like the Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution. You can ignore this one for high energy in the Einstein Bose-Einstein distribution and you get uh, and you get the simple Maxwell-Boltzmann deal. But at low energies the Bose-Einstein is super exponential, the Fermi-Dirac is sub exponential and the exponential one is the classical distinguishable particle version. Now I cooked up some demos here that uh, illustrate how that comes about in a kind of a Monte Carlo way. So I want to see if I can go back here and uh, let's look. Let's start with the distinguishable case. I, it's called the Demon algorithm. Actually, maybe I should uh, show it to you. Let me just pop it open here. So the Demon algorithm, you basically uh, iterate, pick a random particle or state, and then randomly bump a particle up or down in energy and there's this demon. Whenever you take energy out of the system, you give it to the demon. Whenever you want to put energy into the system, you get it from the demon. Now, if the demon doesn't have enough energy, you can't do it. Um, and if the particle doesn't have any energy, if the particle's not in a state that allows you to take energy out, you can't do it. So n sub m here is the number of particles in the empt state, or the st and uh, and E sub D is the energy of the demon. So you just sort of iterate that process over and over again. And what the demon does is it sort of gives you the effect of the particles exchanging energy with one another. Even though you don't have any explicit mechanism for that to happen, you assume there is some mechanism for that to happen. But other than that, you're just in insisting on the rules of quantum mechanics that you count states as boson states or fermion states or distinguishable particle states, and you see what happens. So let's... Uh, Let's go ahead and run this 
for the case of the distinguishable particles. And what you're seeing here is uh, the number of particles in the lowest energy state, the next energy state, the next energy state, and so on. And you'll notice that uh, because I'm just randomly moving energy around, what's happening is the system is naturally evolving to the states that are the most likely, the distribution of, of energies that's most likely. And you can see that it evolves toward a very nice um, exponential looking distribution. So that's, uh, that's the Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution. If you do the same thing with, uh, with bosons, you get a similar kind of behavior, uh, except that the distribution ends up being somewhat super exponential. Now, I haven't done a fit or anything to prove that, and maybe I can get that done before, uh, before the next class, but I, I think you can kind of see that this is going up faster than a, this exponential curve would suggest it would hit over here somewhere, but it's actually going up faster than that. And that's a typical behavior in the Bose-Einstein case, and it's all about what we call a state and uh, how you count that. So that gives you an idea for the Bose-Einstein state. The Fermi-Dirac situation is uh, much more dramatic. So we'll look at that. You'll notice that uh, here the occupation number is one for low energies, and then it drops off to zero for high energies. And there's a sort of a narrow range in the middle where the occupation number falls. And the Fermi energy is right here in the middle uh, where the occupation number goes through one half. Um, the only difference between this and the Bose-Einstein case is that uh, states are never allowed to have more than one particle in them, and uh, and that's basically it. So in the Bose-Einstein case, of course, states can have as many particles as they like. So that's the idea. And uh, let's see, was there anything else? Uh, I think that's all I have time for today. So. We'll see you in class, and we'll do some of those board work calculations I told you about. Okay, finally, in class today, you'll, uh, you'll actually do on the board. I'll give you some hints and get you started, but uh, I want you to be able to calculate the compressibility of a metal and the heat capacity of a solid material. And that's the idea. We'll talk to you soon. Okay, so let's, uh, let's try this again. This will be lesson number eight, take two. Uh, had a little confusion about the first try, but I think I've got it all sorted out, so here we go. First of all, I want to discuss uh, a technique for generating an essentially arbitrary collection of random numbers. So we already know how to generate random numbers that are uniformly distributed, say between zero and one. And we know if we wanted a distribution between 0 and 5, we could just multiply all those numbers by 5, and we would get such a distribution. If we wanted a distribution between 1 and 8, we could multiply by 7 and add 1, and that would produce such a distribution. So uniform distributions are straightforward. But what if we want a distribution that uh, isn't uniform, but has some sort of uh, higher density of probability of in one area and a lower de probability density in some other area, such as we find often in quantum mechanics, for example. Um, so here's an example of a distribution. It's called a Lorentzian. I just sort of pulled it out of the air as an example. There are zillions, literally, of different possible distributions you could imagine. Uh, that basically, any mathematical function that you could normalize could be used as a distribution function for random numbers. Um, and I just wanted to uh, give this thing a try. One thing we have to do is to normalize it. So we have to figure out what this number A is. And we can use our favorite uh, linear, or uh, excuse me, uh, symbolic algebra package to do that. We'll show you here. OK, so here's my favorite um, <coughs> symbolic algebra package. I'm going to define a function. I'll call it f. and. Uh, what we're going to try to do is see if we can integrate that guy. And the way you spell integration in Sage, this is the open source uh, package that I use sometimes, is uh, integrate. And I'm going to integrate this function I've defined from minus infinity to infinity. And Sage tells me that that's equal to pi over a. So I'll go ahead and redefine the function now. 
as the same thing it was before, except now I replace the 1 with a over pi. That means that when I integrate, um, I'll go ahead and tell it to integrate, I get 1. So that tells us that uh, indeed the normalization constant is a over pi. And we discover that the proper normalization is uh, a over pi, where a is a measure of the width of the distribution, and of course pi is pi. Now, we start with that distribution. The question is, how can I use that to generate random numbers that have that distribution? And in order to accomplish that goal, it's useful to introduce the concept of a cumulative distribution function, which is uh, related to the probability density. It's the integral from minus infinity to x of the probability density. And you can see what it does is it gives you the probability of having a number between negative infinity and x. If you, uh, if you think about it, that means that uh, if the distribution is normalized, you've got to get a number between 0 and 1. So let's look at some properties of that guy. So uh, now that we see that it's normalized, we want to define the cumulative distribution function, which is the integral of f of x from minus infinity to x. Of course, in order to make a function of x, I want to integrate over a different variable, so I'll integrate over z. And let's see what that CDF looks like. Here we go. CDF, it's a mapping of x to the arctangent of x minus b over a, all thing divided by pi plus a half. I could rewrite that, I suppose. Uh, let's see, if I say CDF of x, it comes out looking just like a function. Anyway, I've gone ahead and made in the grapher application a, uh, a function that does that. This is my cumulative distribution function. And here is my uh, original probability density. I've turned A into a thing I can fiddle with. So if I adjust A, you see that affects the, the width of the distribution. But uh, I always get a normalized distribution. And the, all that happens to the CDF is that it becomes sharper. If I make a very sharp distribution, the CDF goes from 0 to 1 over a very short range of x. If I, if I make a bigger, it goes from 0 to 1 over a longer range of x. Now, here's the interesting part. What if you imagine uh, generating a random number that is uniformly distributed between 0 and 1? So all these random numbers are going to correspond to different heights. And if I use the CDF to map back from that uniform distribution back down to x, so there's a mapping here between x and the CDF, if I run that thing backwards, I invert the CDF, then my uniform distribution of random numbers uh, maps from 0 to 1 all the way back to the x-axis. And in this case, it's x goes from minus infinity to plus infinity because the CDF is defined over that whole range. The interesting thing is dy here, if I think of this as the y direction, dy is equal to the derivative of the CDF times dx, and, uh, but the derivative of the CDX is, uh, CDF excuse me, is the probability density. So if I have a small range of y's here with some probability, I'll have the corresponding range of x's here with the probability equal to the probability density, the derivative of the CDF. So that's why I can invert the CDF and take a random number in the range 0 to 1 and convert it to a random number pulled from my original probability distribution. And what we discover is that if you start with a random number r that's uniformly distributed between 0 and 1, and you take the inverse of the cumulative distribution function of r, that, that the result of that inverse function is distributed as the original probability density p of x. And we can see how that works. OK, now I have a very simple program. We're going to generate 100 random numbers uh, from 0 to 1. And I'm going to define a and b as I did in the uh, grapher uh, application. If I do this calculation, this is the inversion. The, I'm inverting the cumulative distribution function. And I'm calculating a, a bunch of x's based on these random r's that I calculated up here. And then I'm just going to histogram those guys and show the histogram. So let's run that. 
and you can see what I get. You know, it looks like some kind of a distribution that's centered around 2, but it's not at all obvious that that's Lorenzian. Let's, uh, let's try bumping the number up a little bit. Let's try 1,000. And that's looking a little better. Let's go ahead and try 10,000. Now we're getting something that's definitely looking Lorenzian. Um, let's try 100,000. Okay, now you can clearly see the curve. And finally, let's just try a million for the fun of it, just because we can. So let me close that. Try a million. Uh, I think I can. Hang on. Oh, I got to make that active. There we go. There's a million. And now it's looking quite nice. So uh, you can also see how fast it is. The NumPy number, random number generator is extremely fast. And uh, it's extremely good. So we shouldn't have any trouble with that. Now the next technique I'd like to talk about is something called rejection sampling. The idea <coughs> is that you want to generate random numbers according to a probability density P2, and you already know how to generate random numbers according to a probability density P1. Can you use your knowledge of P1 in order to generate P2? And the idea, of course, P2 in this graph uh, is meant to go to zero, at uh, 1.5 and 2.5, uh, I just couldn't easily get it to not go below zero with straight lines, and so just ignore the parts that go below zero. P2 is zero up to 1.5, and then it's a linearly increasing function, then it's a linearly decreasing function, then it's zero from 2.5 on. So that's the intent there. <coughs> how could I generate that distribution if I know how to generate the distribution P1? The idea is, you pick a random x according to the distribution p1 and then you reject it or accept it depending on the value of the ratio of p2 to p1 so obviously because of the way we've cooked up p2 it's it's always less than p1 everywhere it's not normalized but it's a function that's less than p1 everywhere and so if I accept the x value with the probability that's equal to the ratio of p2 to p1, you'll notice that what I'm doing is throwing away some of the x's from the p1 distribution in such a way that the x's that I accept will automatically have the distribution p2. That's the idea. So you accept x sub i with the probability equal to p2 divided by p1. And that's, and you reject the other one, since that's, that's why it's called the rejection sampling scheme. Let's uh, get a demo of how that's going to work. So this is the rejection method, and uh, here we have the P1 probability and the P2 probability, which you'll recognize. Here's the Lorenz generator encapsulated as a function. Here I have a list of results that I'm collecting, and, uh, and then the idea is I first generate x random numbers according to the Lorentz distribution. Then I compute the ratio p2 to p1, and I keep those where a random number is less than that ratio, a uniformly distributed random number between 0 and 1. If it's less than that ratio, I keep them. If, uh, if it's not less than that ratio, I just ignore those guys. And then I'm, I'm going to calculate here, the first time through, I'm going to calculate the fraction of the numbers that I accept. And I'm going to use that to predict how many new numbers I need to generate in order to produce the number that I want. So I add the uh, new x's to my list of results. Then I generate a new n, which is the number I need to request in order to get the number that I want. And notice, I take the difference between the number that I want and the number that I have divided by the acceptance fraction, which means, let's say I got 70% the first time, if I divide that by 0.7, then uh, that'll give me a big enough number that I should get it in the next go. So hopefully this only runs once or, or twice at the most. Uh, maybe occasionally it might run three times, but uh, most of the time you'll get it in two two shots. And uh, and then I just make a histogram of the, of the results. So let's try that. I'm only ask for 100 and uh, let's see what we get 
and we get something you can see it's sort of distributed between 1.5 and 2.5 but it's not looking terribly triangular let's try with a thousand and this time it's getting more triangular how about 10,000 now we're getting a decidedly triangular sort of look let's try a hundred thousand now with the 100,000 numbers, you can definitely see that triangular nature there. So it's clearly working. We'll go up to a million just for grins. And there you have it, a million random numbers distributed uh, with this triangle shape. Fascinating. Very good. So next is the Metropolis algorithm. I had incorrectly labeled the rejection sampling Metropolis algorithm before. I apologize. The Metropolis algorithm is slightly different, although it's slightly similar. And because of the similarities, I had mixed it up in my head. And uh, But now I've got it all straight. Uh, if you start with any distribution of x's, and then you give them a little bump. So you just give them a little random kick, move them around a little bit. And then if the new probability, if the probability of one of the bumped x's is greater than the old probability, in other words, you take the probability density function you want to produce and you compare the probability at the new x to the probability at the old x. If it goes up, you accept it unconditionally. Now obviously if you've got a thousand x's and you bump all thousand of them, some of them are going to go up in probability, some of them are going to go down. The ones that go up, you take. The ones that go down, you accept with a probability equal to the ratio of the new to the old. Now, you only do this for the ones where p nu is less than p old, so this probability will definitely be less than 1, which is good for a probability. And so it turns out you'll reject the ones where the new probability goes down a lot. But if the new probability only goes down a little bit, you'll generally accept those guys. And so, and you can prove, which I'm not going to prove because I don't have time for that, but you can prove that if you do that for a long period of time, that on the average, the x's will distribute themselves according to the probability distribution that you wish to produce. So we'll get a little demo of how that works. OK, so here's the Metropolis algorithm. Um, here's the basic idea. We start with a certain number of random numbers, and we're going to iterate this many times. This is the size of the bump when I bump them on each time step. I still have my the parameters of my desired probability distribution, but now I, I no longer have any other probability distribution, just the one I'm interested in. And here's the function that shakes the numbers up. You just add a Gaussian with the width of delta, and uh, that shakes them around. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to keep track of the acceptance ratios, the fraction that I accept. I'm going to start with a uniform distribution uh, between um, b minus a half a and b plus a half a, roughly. Uh, and no, I'm sorry, b minus a and b plus a, just a little tiny bit less than b minus a to b plus a. And uh, I can evaluate the probability at the current x's just by applying x to the function. And uh, I'm going to make a histogram of where everybody is. And uh, here are these two guys. I can either display the histogram every step, or I can accumulate the histogram every step, or I can just wait till the end and accumulate it at the end. So if these are both 0, I just wait till the end. Otherwise, I'm displaying the particle histogram on every step. Here I display the accumulated particle histogram on every step. And uh, basically this just executes the Metropolis algorithm. You um, shake up the x's, you crack calculate the probability at the new x's, you take the ratio of the new probability with the old probability. If that ratio is greater than 1, you definitely accept it. If it's not greater than 1, you accept it conditionally. And uh, the condition is that the ratio is less than um, a random number. So here, are, here's the ratio. You check to see if a random number is less than that ratio. Sorry, I had it backwards. You check to see if the random number is less than the ratio. If it is, you accept. If it isn't, you reject. And that means that if the probability goes down just a little bit, chances are you'll accept it. But if it goes down a lot, you probably won't accept it. And then you just iterate that over and over again. And that's all this code does. Um, 
You can display it every step, display accumulated over the entire run, or you can just wait till the end. That's what these guys do. So the details aren't that critical at this moment. I just want you to understand the idea. So let's go ahead and run it. I'm going to, at the moment, I have this thing set up to show the histogram every step. So I'll get this out of the way, and we can watch it. Notice it started out as a uh, uniform distribution, and you can see that random numbers are bouncing around, and they look like they could very well be uh, semi-triangular. Um, but let's uh, let's bump the numbers up a little bit. Let's go to 10,000 particles, and you can see now it's looking much more triangular. But um, Still, you can see there's a lot of variability in there, and uh, it's hard to tell if the average really works out to be triangular exactly. So um, let's see what happens if I show the accumulated histogram. In other words, now every time step we're going to add the histograms together, and you can see what happens to the overall histogram. Notice the scale is getting bigger now because we keep adding the histograms together. But look at what's happening to the sides of our distribution. It's it's uh, straightening out nicely. And uh, let's bump up the number of iterations a little bit. We'll go to 100,000 particles. And let's go for like 1,000 iterations uh, and see what happens. Now you can really see the thing um, becoming triangular. So that's how that works. Let's go ahead and change it so that it just shows us, goes ahead and accumulates over all time. Just show, show us the answer. Don't bother us with the uh, animation in the middle. And we'll see what happens. Hopefully this won't take too long. There we go. OK, beautiful. And uh, also, this way, we get to see the acceptance ratio. And notice that the acceptance ratio is uh, somewhere in the neighborhood of 70%, a little more than 70%. So you get the idea that uh, most of the time we accept. All right, and that's how it works. Finally, I just want to introduce you to the concept of quantum Monte Carlo, diffusion quantum Monte Carlo. It's just a trick basically, that enables you to use Monte Carlo techniques to estimate quantum wave functions. Uh, generally, quantum wave functions of ground states, but it is possible through various tricks to do excited states as well. But let's just discuss the concept. If you take the time variable in the Schrodinger wave equation and you make it imaginary, the Schrodinger wave equation is suddenly transformed into a real differential equation. It happens to be exactly the diffusion equation. You can use Monte Carlo techniques to solve the diffusion equation by simulating the diffusion process. And in the end, the uh, density of the diffusing particles in the diffusion equation turns out to take a shape that's exactly the solution to the diffusion equation. And of course, if the Schrodinger wave equation is written in such a way that its solutions become solutions to the diffusion equation, then you can generate solutions to the Schrodinger wave equation by solving the diffusion equation using a Monte Carlo technique. That's the idea. And that's the whole show. I hope, uh, I hope it was somewhat useful, and uh, we'll see you guys next time. Hey guys, welcome back. It's time for Lesson 11. We're going to start with time-independent perturbation theory and a little more about ion traps. So let's get started. The whole idea here is let's suppose we already have a problem we've solved, like the simple harmonic oscillator or the hydrogen atom or the infinite square well, and uh, we want to add a little change, not a big change, but a small change to the original Hamiltonian. So h hat is going to be our full Hamiltonian. And h0 hat is the original Hamiltonian we started with, the one we already know how to solve. And h1 hat is going to be some small change that we're going to make to the Hamiltonian. So like a bump or a little added force or a little added potential energy, something like that. And the idea is to expand the quantum states 
of the perturbed Hamiltonian as a superposition of the known solutions to the unperturbed Hamiltonian. So we're going to think of the perturbation as changing our solution states from being uh, the original states to the original states plus some little bits and pieces of the other states because we know that um, any state can be written as a superposition of the solutions to the original Hamiltonian. So thinking that we could use the solutions to the original Hamiltonian as a basis to describe the solutions to the perturbed Hamiltonian seems like a reasonable place to start. So the idea is the energy of the perturbed states, we're going to think of it as, a, as kind of like a power series or a Taylor series, something like that, where the zeroth term is the original energy, the unperturbed energy, and then there's the first order correction and the second order correction and the third order correction, which we'll have to add to that in order to get the solution to some level of accuracy. And the idea is that if the perturbation is small, you don't have to do very many terms in this series to get an idea of the effect. Okay, um, the superscripts here I need to point out are not exponents. So E0 is not E to the power zero, it's just the zeroth order or the original energy of the unperturbed Hamiltonian. And E1 is a first order correction. So you could think of that as something that's, say, linear in the perturbation. That's the idea. And we'll see exactly what that means here in a minute. So the idea is that you think of the solution to the perturbed Hamiltonian as the original state plus a little added bit, that's the first order correction, and then a little even tinier bit, that's the second order correction, and so on. And uh, of course, the problem we want to solve is the Hamiltonian acting on the nth solution is equal to the nth energy times the nth solution back again. But we can put in what we know the energy eigenvalue is going to be in terms of its uh, perturbation components, the zeroth order, first order, second order, and also put in what we expect the solutions to be, the superpositions of the different orders of um, the solution to the perturbation, and we get a new eigenvalue equation. And the idea is to multiply this thing out and then collect terms of like powers. So for example, the zeroth order term, you take the zeroth order terms from the left hand side and the zeroth order terms from the right hand side and see what you get. Of course what you get is that the original Hamiltonian acting on the original state is equal to the original energy times the original state again. That's just a statement of the eigenvalue problem for the unperturbed Hamiltonian. So that's clearly okay. Then you say, well what's the first order situation? Well there's two first order terms. There's the original Hamiltonian acting on the perturbed state and there's the perturbation acting on the original state. And that's got to equal to the unperturbed energy multiplied by the perturbation, the first order uh, perturbation, plus the perturbed first, first order perturbation of the energy times the unperturbed state. So notice that each of those terms, if you add the uh, orders, they add up to one. So that's kind of the idea. And you can get the second thing, for the same thing for the second order. You get the unperturbed Hamiltonian on the second order correction plus the first order Hamiltonian on the first order correction is equal to the original energy times the second order state plus the first order perturbation of the energy times the first order perturbation of the state plus the second order perturbation of the energy times the original state. That's hard to say, but it's easy to see what's going on. Okay, so let's... Uh, Let's collect some of this together and see what, if we can get any answers. The first question is, what's the, uh, what's the situation with the first order perturbation to the energy? So the idea here is, if we multiply on the left by the unperturbed state, what we get is, uh, if we multiply everything out, notice that first term on the left, you can multiply the unperturbed Hamiltonian to the unperturbed state on the left, and you get E0, the unperturbed energy, times N0 on N1. Then the middle term, there's not much you can do with that. This term on the right, the first term on the right, notice that the E0 is, that's just a, uh, a number, 
it's the original unperturbed energy, so it comes out, and you get N0 and N1, and then E1 is also just a number, but it's multiplied by N0 on N0, but of course N0 on N0 is just 1, and the term that we had out in front, the E0 on N0 inner product with N1, shows up on both sides of the equal sign, so it cancels, and what you get is that uh, the inner product, or I should say the expectation value of the perturbed Hamiltonian, the perturbation part of the Hamiltonian, in the original unperturbed state is the first order perturbation to the energy. So that's an important result, that's our first real result of perturbation theory, and basically what it says you can read it, the perturbed energy is the expectation value of the perturbation Hamiltonian in the unperturbed state. Very nice. That's, that's kind of even easy to remember. And we're going to do a board work problem today where we'll work that out for a concrete example. So uh, what about the first order perturbed state? Let's go to see if we can calculate the, uh, some kind of a superposition for N1. And we'll go back to the first order correction that we wrote out earlier. And what I want to do is to take the inner product with some other state, let's call it M0, that's not the... Uh, so I want to find an expression for the uh, correction to the eigenstate of a particular state, and I want to take the inner product with a different unperturbed state. So for example, if I wanted to find the perturbation of the ground state of the infinite square well, I would take the inner product with some other state, not the ground state, uh, maybe an excited state of some kind. And what you find is uh, the following thing. Again, you can apply H0 on the left and get the mth unperturbed energy. The middle term, there's not much you can do with that. It's just something you need to compute. It's an integral of some kind. The perturbation integrated sandwich between the mth and the nth unperturbed state. And then of course on the right hand side these un these energies are all um, just numbers so they come out. Uh, one thing I want you to notice right away is that m0 and n0 are different unperturbed states and they generally are orthogonal to each other so we can get rid of that. And uh, you notice that uh, if we fiddle around with that a little bit, you've got an M0 on N1 on the left, you've got an M0 on N1 on the right. You can move those guys over to the left-hand side, move the M0 uh, H1 on N0, and solve the thing for the inner product of M0 on N1. This tells you how much of the mth, not the nth, but the mth original unperturbed eigenstate is in the perturbed state N1. And notice that it's, uh, it's proportional to this inner product of the perturbation between the unperturbed states. And there's a denominator here. It's sometimes called the energy denominator. And it's uh, the difference in energy between the two states involved in the, in the matrix element the, in this uh, inner product calculation. And uh, so what I want to do now is to go back and rewrite N1 is I, the identity times N1. But the identity is the superposition. Remember how the identity worked? It's the superposition of all the basis states of the ket times the bra. But uh, I want to exclude the original unperturbed state because I have assumed all along that uh, I'm going to ignore any component of the unperturbed state in the uh, value of N1 because N1 is the change of the state and of course I'm already adding it to the unperturbed state so I, I don't want to include any component of the unperturbed state because I've already got it in there. So the point is the sum is not a complete sum but it's only the sum over the states excluding the original unperturbed state it started with. and. Uh, if you plug all that in, you put in the uh, result we just got for M0 and N1, and you get the following result. Um, 
that the new that the perturbation to the state is uh, m0 times m0 on h1 acting on n0. So uh, it's this uh, it's sort of like the identity except it's not because there's this perturbation and I have to divide by the energy difference. So it's a little more complicated probably worth doing a few problems just to kind of see how that works but it gives you an idea of how to compute the new state in the in the presence of this perturbation okay and how do we get the second order energy it's basically the same kind of deal except now we use that second order line that we started with on the first slide again we take the inner product with n0 and uh, we multiply it all out and we see what what we're left with um, the first term, again, we apply H0 on the left. The middle term, there's not a lot we can do with that. These guys on the right are all just numbers, so we can pop those guys out. And let's see what we've got there. First of all, the E0 on the inner product of N0 and N2 is the same on both sides, so it goes away. We also see that N0 on N1 is zero. Remember n1 is a superposition of only states that exclude the unperturbed state n. And uh, n0 on n0 is just one. So we get out of this an expression for e2. Now this is uh, even easier in a way. e2 is the expectation value of h1 between the unperturbed state and the perturbed state. But we can put in our expression for the perturbed state in terms of the unperturbed states. We just worked it out. Plug that into the expression we just got for E2. Uh, take the sum out to the outside. And notice that what we have is N0, H1, M0 times M0, H1, N0. Those are just complex conjugates of one another. So I can simplify the expression by simply calling this the magnitude squared of that quantity and that gives us an expression for the second order correction to the energy looks a little complicated again with some practice you'll see how this actually comes comes out next time not today but next time we're going to talk about what happens if uh, we have degenerate states so we've assumed that the original unperturbed eigenstates are all non-degenerate this would be true if it was a one-dimensional problem in a higher dimensional problem like the hydrogen atom or the uh, two-dimensional simple harmonic oscillator or something like that you often have cases where you have states of degenerate energy and you see we're going to run into trouble with that denominator if we permit states of degenerate energy so we have to be a little careful in those cases and that requires a whole nother day to think about so we'll do that next time i don't want to give you guys too much in one day and i do want to though point out some a little bit more about ion traps remember we talked about a potential if you have a, a potential that satisfies laplace's equation the sum of the coefficients of the quadratic terms has to be zero but if you throw in a uh, oscillating factor like cosine omega t you can make the thing stable and I want to keep marching down the road of getting you guys plugged into how that works let's go ahead and compute the electric field take the gradient of the thing then put in Newton's second law the mass times acceleration is equal to Q times E of course we just worked out E so we can pick, write that out and uh, then I want you to remember about this demo so uh, I'll run the demo again here briefly and let's look at the actual motion of the guys in the presence of this oscillating field. Okay, so here we are looking at our ion trap again. I'm going to turn on the time. And I just want you to notice that there's a kind of a slow motion of the ion. But if you look at it closely, you'll see that there's also a high frequency sort of wiggle that's going on. I would call that the fast motion. And... Uh, so the idea of the approach we're going to take is to separate the fast motion from the slow motion. The slow motion is sort of the drift of the ion back and forth. The fast motion is this little wiggle that's going on. And that's the idea. Okay, what you noticed, I hope, is that you've got really two motions. There's sort of a slow drifty motion of the ion through the field. And there's the fast wiggly motion that's in response to this cosine that's wiggling very quickly. 
And I want to think of R as being a superposition of a slow part and a fast part. Now the fast part, um, if you plug that into Newton's second law and take MR double dot, the fast part is going to have a bigger double dot than the slow part because it's just got a lot more acceleration. It's wiggling like crazy. That's that wiggle that I want to think of as the fast part. If I take the second derivative, I'm going to get something like minus omega squared times the fast part again. So let's, uh, let's look at that. I'll neglect the slow part compared to the fast part when I take the second derivative. And that means for our MR double dot, I can just put in minus omega squared times the fast component of the motion. And if I break out the x and y components of this equation, I can solve for the fast and the slow component, or the fast x and the fast y components of the motion. You can see that the magnitude of the fast part is inversely proportional to the frequency squared. But the other thing I want to notice is that the amplitude of the fast part is proportional to how far the ion is from the origin. So I want to pull the demo back up again here briefly and point out that it also follows that basic behavior. Okay, real quick, I just want to point out one other thing and just show you that it works out the same as our, our model. If you watch the amplitude of this um, motion, notice that when it crosses near the origin, the amplitude becomes quite small. So it is true that the amplitude of the fast motion goes to zero as the, uh, as the particle passes close to the origin. So that gives us some hope that the thing is valid. All right, here we are at lesson 12. Hard to believe. It's, uh, it's time for perturbation theory again, but this time we're going to deal with the case when the eigenstates we start with are degenerate. And you may remember that that's problematic with uh, just the perturbation theory we worked out last time because there was this denominator that had the difference between the energy that uh, of the state you started with and the energy of the other states. And if, uh, if you're incorporating a state that has the same energy, then you're going to have trouble. Um, and we're also going to talk about ion traps again. We're going to deal with the, the slow motion. Last time we dealt with the fast motion. Now we're going to deal with the slow motion. So let's get started. Um, so the idea is, what if we have two states in the unperturbed system that have the same energy? So for example, you've got state A that has the energy E0, and you've got another state, state B, that also happens to have the same energy. Um, a superposition of these two states also happens to be an eigenstate with the same energy. So these two, two states, in fact, form kind of a subspace that uh, of the full uh, solution that have uh, all the states that have the same energy. There are like a two-dimensional subspace that happens to have the same energy. If you have a superposition, then that superposition also has the same eigenvalue of energy. So you can imagine um, what happens if I have a perturbation. So I add a perturbation to the original Hamiltonian. I still have the uh, what you call eigenvalue problem. But notice that I can throw away the unperturbed part because it already solves its own eigenvalue problem. And what I get is kind of a new eigenvalue problem with the perturbation acting on the superposition and the correction, the first order correction to the energy uh, times the superposition. And we can work out what that means. So for example, if I um, factor out H1 and then take the inner product with psi A again, I get this equation. Now notice that uh, psi a h1 psi a, that's a, just an integral I can do. It's a number. Psi a h1 psi b, that's a different integral. Uh, these things are called matrix elements, but they're basically just numbers. And uh, psi a on psi a, of course, is 1. And I can do the same thing with psi b. And you can see that, uh, again, I get a times this number plus b times another number is equal to b times the correction to the energy. And when I put those two equations together, you can see that, uh, in fact, uh, what I have is a system of equations. 
just a two uh, two linear equations with two unknowns. And uh, I can solve that with linear algebra. I can think of that as a matrix which with these matrix elements times the vector AB is equal to uh, the correction to the energy times the vector AB. Does that uh, problem look familiar to you? Of course, it's the eigenvalue problem. It's the uh, same problem we solved last semester when we were dealing with finite systems with finite number of states like the ammonia molecule or the spin of an electron we ended up with these finite matrices and the eigenvalue problem is basically the way you find solutions to the uh, the Schrodinger equation at this point we're looking for simultaneous eigenvalues of the original and perturbed Hamiltonians you know that uh, any superposition of the two originally uh, degenerate states is going to be an additional degenerate state and so we're looking for superpositions of the degenerate state that also happen to diagonalize the perturbation in other words that are solutions to the eigenvalue problem for the perturbation that's the idea and the eigenvalues we get from this eigenvalue problem are going to be the first order energy corrections now that's all kind of abstract so let's do a concrete example Let's imagine we have a two-dimensional simple harmonic oscillator with the potential that you guys all know. And we throw in a perturbation that uh, messes it up. So this particular perturbation I'm imagining is the product of x times y. And uh, you, can, you can generate that by adding a, uh, an electric field that solves Laplace's equation. And I, we can talk about that at some other point. But let's just imagine we have this potential that we are adding to the original isotropic uh, two-dimensional simple harmonic oscillator and uh, gamma is just some number that has units of energy divided by length squared but it's small compared to the typical energies you'd find in the simple harmonic oscillator let's say small compared to maybe h bar omega and so let's march ahead now let's look at the ground state the ground state of the system is uh, is singular there's only one it's not a degenerate state so we can just use regular old perturbation theory to deal with that one so I'm, I'm gonna ignore that for the moment and uh, let's look at uh, 1 0 and 0 1 and uh, see what happens to those guys now they are degenerate uh, 0 0 of course has the energy h bar omega over 2 1 0 and 0 1 both have the same energy 3 halves h bar omega and uh, and so their degenerate state let's just call the one where the x direction is excited and the y direction is in the ground state uh, a and we'll call the one where the x direction is in the ground state and the y direction is excited let's call that b so psi a and psi b form a little subspace of degenerate energy eigenstates and any superposition of those two is also degenerate with both of those guys so we can think of a superposition as being a little bit of a and a little bit of b you can think of it in linear algebra terms as a vector uh, with the top element is the coefficient of psi a and the bottom element is the coefficient of psi b and just as we worked out a few minutes ago you can imagine solving the eigenvalue problem which is the perturbation acting on the superposition is equal to the first energy first order correction to the energy acting on the superposition so let's work on that. We, uh, we need to find these matrix elements, AA, AB, BA, and BB. But now we have a concrete perturbation. So let's go in and compute them. If I put the perturbation in, uh, it's x times y. But remember, x is a plus plus a minus, and y is a plus plus a minus. Of course, they're individual raising and lowering operators that act only on the x and y parts. But uh, that's how they go. And you'll notice that uh, since I have the same state on the right and the left, that this thing has to be 0. Because a minus on 1 gives you 0, but I've got 1 on the left. And a plus on 1 gives you 2, but I've got 1 on the left. And that, so both of those are going to give me 0. Same thing with the y direction. So I get nothing out of, psi, uh, out of H1AA. But what about H1AB? Here, uh, the a plus x on the left is going to act on 0 on the right-hand ket, and it'll give me a 1. But there's a 1 in the left-hand ket, so that is not nothing. In fact, um, the x and the y operator in this matrix element each give you 1, 
and so the answer turns out to be gamma x0 squared over 2. And by symmetry, HBA is equal to HAB, and HAA is equal to HBB. So I are, now I know the four elements of my matrix. I can go ahead and write those out, um, and they look like this. So now the plan is I rewrite this by moving the E1 to the other side of the equation, and uh, I get the eigenvalue determinant has to be equal to 0. And you can see that that means that E1 squared has to be gamma x0 squared over 2, which means E1 has to be plus or minus gamma x0 squared over 2. So now we have our two eigenvalues. These are the two eigenvalues that solve the eigenvalue problem. So if, uh, if I stick these eigenvalues back into the original equation, it's, uh, it's fairly easy to show that if E1 is plus gamma x0 squared over 2, then the solution has to be A and B are equal to one another, which means that uh, you get the solution psi plus, which is the sum of the two eigenstates, A and B. And if you put in E1 is minus gamma, then you get psi minus is the difference. And A is equal to minus B, in other words. And uh, so if you graph the energy of those guys, as a function of gamma, essentially, you see that psi plus goes up in energy, psi minus goes down in energy. So the point is that this perturbation breaks the symmetry of these uh, degenerate excited states, 1, 0, and 0, 1, and makes them into two different states with uh, different energy. So that's the idea. Okay, now back to ion traps. Now you may remember we, uh, we worked out last time the fast motion and uh, we did it by taking the potential, the time dependent potential, and sticking it into Newton's second law, separating out the slow and the fast motion, and then making the claim that the second derivative of the position uh, of the fast motion was much much larger than the second derivative of the slow position and uh, we got as a result of that the fast position is a function of time in the x direction and the y direction. Now notice there's a sign difference here between x and y and that is uh, significant. Um, if we put this fast motion back into the equation and then what I want to do is to average this uh, differential equation, Newton's second law, over one full cycle. Notice that there's a sign difference in the fast solution for x and y, and there's also a sign difference in the electric field for x and y. The x has a minus sign in the electric field, the y has a plus sign in the electric field. But if we average all these pieces over one cycle, let's see what we get. So if we average the slow second derivative over one cycle, remember the slow motion doesn't have the high frequency omega in it, so when you average over one cycle, you don't get a big change. It's basically just the second derivative of the slow motion. On the other hand, if you average the fast second derivative over one cycle, it does have the cosine omega t in it, and the average of cosine omega t is zero. So you don't get anything from, the av from averaging the fast motion over one cycle. Now what if you average uh, the x slow motion times the cosine of omega t over one cycle? Well, the slow motion doesn't have any high frequencies in it, so if you multiply the slow motion by the cosine of this high frequency, you're not going to get much because you're, you're going to get a full cycle of a cosine times something that's almost constant, and that's going to give you zero. But what happens if you average the fast motion times the cosine of omega t? Well, if you put the solution in for the fast motion, remember the fast motion has a cosine in it already, and if you multiply by cosine, you're going to get a cosine squared. Now, the average of a cosine squared over one cycle is not zero because cosine squared never goes below zero. And so the, you can put in for the average of cosine squared just a half. Notice also that the fast amplitude was proportional to the slow position. So what I wind up with is a constant times the slow position. And similarly, if you put in the, uh, the y fast motion and average it times the cosine of theta, uh, cosine omega t over one cycle, you get a constant times the slow y-coordinate. And notice again, there's a sign difference between the x and the y. But if I put this average back in to Newton's second law, the sign differences 
in the electric field and the sign differences in the average of the fast coordinate over a full cycle combine so that now there's no sign difference between the two sides. X and Y both have a minus sign overall. And notice that what we have is minus a constant times the slow coordinate i hat plus the y coordinate j hat. But that's nothing other than the r vector, the slow r vector. So what we really have is rs double dot is minus a constant times rs. Well, that you'll recognize is the recipe for simple harmonic motion. So what we get is rs is uh, minus omega squared capital omega squared times uh, rs and uh, I'm sorry, rs double dot is minus capital omega squared times rs. Omega is the square root of all that junk, and we get the solution that the slow motion is simply the uh, original coordinate, the position coordinate, um, times the cosine of omega t plus phi. And uh, of course, there, there could be uh, a velocity term in there, I guess, uh, but uh, anyway, you get the idea. The, the point is that uh, what we have is simple harmonic motion. The initial conditions determine, um, well, the phi. The phi gives you the initial conditions. So that, that tells you the whole story, and that's all there is to it. Hey, guys, it's time for Lesson 13. We're going to be applying some of the things we've learned about perturbation theory to a few situations that we sort of left from the hydrogen atom, but we didn't deal with. So the theory of the hydrogen atom that we used last semester ignored the fact that uh, the speed of the electrons is borderline relativistic and the um, and the fact that the electron in the hydrogen atom has a spin and an associated magnetic moment and as a result of having a magnetic moment it can interact with magnetic fields. Now you might think, well, there's no currents around, there's no sources of magnetic field around, so what relevance does that have? And the answer is, in the frame of reference of the electron, there is a magnetic field. And the magnetic field comes from the electric field of the proton. So uh, we'll talk about that more in a minute, but let, let's start with the relativistic correction. So it turns out that the uh, kinetic energy that we used to solve the hydrogen atom looked like this. It's the classical kinetic energy, p squared over 2m, and it's wrong. It's wrong because the actual kinetic energy is the total relativistic energy minus the rest energy. And so we ought to use this expression. Now, there's a way to do that, which is you cook up something called the Dirac equation, and you solve it. That's way beyond the scope of what we're going to do this semester. So one way to deal with it is to say, well, what if I tr treat that square root uh, as a power series? So what I'm going to do is notice that the square root of 1 plus x squared, you can expand as a Taylor series, and it's 1 plus x squared over 2 minus x to the fourth over 8, and so on. Then if I put in x is pc over mc squared, I get that K is the classical kinetic energy. And then I have to add in a few corrections. And of course, if I want to get it exact, I have to add an infinite number of corrections. But what we're going to find is that these corrections become extremely small extremely quickly. So for example, K0 is the kinetic energy of the electron. That has the same order of magnitude as the uh, total energy of the electron. It's about 13.6 electron volts in the ground state, something like that. So um, we'll call it 10 electron volts. And then K1, the first correction to the kinetic energy, goes like P squared over M cubed C squared. And then the next correction goes like P to the sixth. So let's look at the size of these things. K0 is around 10 electron volts. MC squared is like half a million electron volts. And so the ratio of k1 to k0 is the same as the ratio of the kinetic energy of the electron classically to the rest energy. And that kind of makes some intuitive sense. Then notice that because k squared goes like p to the sixth, the ratio between k2 and k1, the second order correction and the first order correction, 
is also order of magnitude k0 over mc squared. But what is k0 over mc squared? Um, well, it's something like 10 to the negative 5. And so what that means is that uh, k1 is about one part in 100,000 of the classical kinetic energy. And k2 is something like a part in 100,000, two parts in 100,000 of that. So uh, we're going to worry about the first correction, but we're not going to worry about the second one because it's 100,000 times smaller, or 50,000 times smaller. So we'll worry about k1. We're going to forget about k2. So let's throw k2 out and focus on k1. k1 is p squared, basically, over uh, mc squared. Of course, there's an m, another m squared in there. So we want the expectation value of k1 in the state of the of the electron, the, the first order correction of perturbation theory, the first order correction to the energy, is the expectation value of the perturbation in the state that you're interested in. And so what we're after is the expectation value of p to the fourth, essentially, in any particular state of the, uh, of the hydrogen atom. Now the interesting thing is uh, p to the fourth, you could think of it as uh, the original Hamiltonian, the unperturbed Hamiltonian, plus the negative of the potential energy. Now remember the original unperturbed Hamiltonian is the kinetic energy plus the potential energy. So if I subtract the potential energy, I've just got the, uh, <coughs> the kinetic energy, which goes like p squared. And so h0 minus the potential energy squared is going to be proportional to p to the fourth. And why is that useful? It's useful because I can use it to figure out a way to compute the matrix element of p to the fourth using the known matrix elements of the original Hamiltonian and the potential energy. So that's what we're going to do. So we square that thing. We're going to get three terms. We're going to get an h0 squared. We're going to get an h0 divided by r. And we're going to get a 1 over r squared. So the h0 squared is easy because that's just the square of the unperturbed energy. Then the next thing we have to worry about is the uh, h0 times 1 over r. But of course, h0 is just the unperturbed energy. And so that reduces to uh, the unperturbed energy times the expectation value of 1 over r. But of course, uh, there's a thing called the virial theorem that allows you to know that the expectation value of the potential energy is minus twice the expectation value of the kinetic energy. You might have done the virial theorem when you were taking your analytical dynamics class. But uh, anyway, you can look it up. It's a neat little theorem. The relationship between kinetic and potential energy has to do with the power of R in the potential. And uh, for potentials that go like 1 over R, it turns out the potential energy is minus twice the kinetic energy, something like that. Anyway, there you can easily calculate this just using the virial theorem. You don't even have to do an integral. But uh, the last term is the 1 over r squared term. And for that, you do need to do an integral. The integral turns out to be like this. It has an l plus a half in the denominator and an n cubed down there. Um, there is a complete treatment of all this stuff in the Hans Bethe and Edwin Salpeter quantum mechanics, 1 and 2 electron atoms. You can. You can look that up if you want to, but uh, basically I'm just telling you the answer. I don't expect you to actually work that out at this point. And when you, uh, when you plug all that back in, what you get is the expectation value of the perturbation. When you put all three terms back together, it, it looks like this. Notice it only depends on L. So if you know L, then you can work out the expectation value of the perturbation. OK. Now let's, uh, let's go ahead and talk about the spin-orbit coupling. The spin-orbit coupling is, remember I mentioned that the magnetic field, that the, that the uh, spin magnetic moment, that the electron's mag magnetic moment sees, has to do with the magnetic field produced in the frame of reference of the electron by the electrostatic field of the proton in the laboratory. So uh, and that Hamiltonian, of course, is minus the magnetic moment dotted into the magnetic field. 
So this is a formula you probably learned in uh, your electrodynamics class. Um, I'm just going to write down the answer. I'm, I'm working on a explanation of this effect that's a little more detailed than what you see in the book. The book basically goes into the frame of reference of the electron and treats the proton as a Biot-Savart current that produces a magnetic field at the location of the electron. But then you have to do all kinds of monkey business to get back to the right answer. Um, and uh, anyway, I'm working on something. I don't know if I'll be able to work it out. But uh, anyway, you can read what De Griffiths has to say. You can just take my word for it. Um, but there is a correction to the energy. The perturbation is proportional to S because the magnetic moment depends on S. And it's proportional to L because the... Biot-Savart magnetic field from the proton depends on L. Or if you like, the um, magnetic field observed by the electron due to the Lorentz transformed electrostatic field of the proton depends on L. So you end up with the dot product of S and L. And uh, that is the perturbation. Now the thing is, the total angular momentum J is L plus S. And what we're going to find out is that while L no longer commutes with the Hamiltonian, do, does not commute with the perturbation, and S does not commute with the perturbation, that the sum of the two, J, does happen to commute with the perturbation. Let's look at that. If you calculate the commutator of L dot S and L, you do not get zero. The commutator of L dot S and L almost magically turns out to be the cross product of L and S. And the commutator of L dot S and S turns out to be the cross product of S and L. But if you calculate the commutator of L dot S and J, that's the commutator of L dot S and L plus the commutator of L dot S and S. And if you know anything about cross products, you know that if you take the cross product of A cross B, it's the negative of the cross product of B cross A. Well, that's also true of L and S. So if you add those two cross products together, guess what you get? Nothing. So what that means is while L dot S does not commute with L and L dot S does not compute with S, L dot S does commute with their sum, which is J. So what does that mean? Remember that the time rate of change of an expectation value of an operator is the commutator of that operator with the Hamiltonian. If the operator commutes with the Hamiltonian, it means that it is a conserved, its eigenvalues, if you measure it, it doesn't change in time. So J is a uh, conserved quantity. J does not change in time. But L and S do not commute with the perturbation. Therefore, under the influence of this perturbation, neither L nor S are conserved. They change in time. Now you can also show that L dot S does commute with the length of L, the magnitude of L, and L dot S does commute with the magnitude of S. So the magnitude of L and the magnitude of S don't change, but the individual components of L and S do change. Having said that, the sum of L and S does not change, and the magnitude of the sum, obviously, if the sum doesn't change, then the magnitude of the sum doesn't change. And so uh, we get J squared, L squared, and S squared are all conserved. J is conserved, but L and S alone, individually, are not conserved. Now what is J squared? J squared is the dot product of L plus S with itself. But if you work that out, that's the magnitude of L squared plus the magnitude of S squared plus twice the dot product of L and S. And we can use that as a trick to figure out what L dot S is in terms of the magnitudes. L dot S is half of J squared minus L squared minus S squared. This is a really important trick. You, we use it all the time uh, if we're doing angular momentum calculations. And so it's sort of burn that into your memory banks or whatever. But uh, the point is, since the spin orbit coupling perturbation is proportional to L dot S, we can use that to work out the um, the size of this guy 
uh, we do need the expectation value of 1 over r cubed because you can see that it depends on 1 over r cubed. And so when the smoke clears and you put everything together, you get the following result that the perturbation, uh, the first order uh, perturbation energy of the spin orbit coupling goes like j times j plus 1 minus l times l plus 1 minus s times s plus 1. That's just the l dot s um, term. Uh, of course, s is a half, so uh, s times s plus 1 is 3 fourths. And downstairs, we've got l times l plus a half times l plus 1. That comes from the expectation value of 1 over r cubed. And, uh, and that's how the whole thing turns out. You can simplify that. Uh, if you add the spin orbit coupling correction and the relativistic correction together, it turns out they have a roughly the same order of magnitude. The whole thing ends up depending only on j, which is sort of amazing. And uh, if we have time, we can work some of that out. It's a little tedious, but it is possible to do it. And, uh, and you can see how it turns out. But the total fine structure this is the so-called fine structure correction. It's a combination of the spin orbit coupling correction and the relativistic correction. And it ends up only depending on j, the j quantum number. The very last thing I want to discuss is the Zeeman effect. And the Zeeman effect is what you get when you put a hydrogen atom, or any, any atom, basically, in a magnetic field. You get a, uh, a Hamiltonian that comes from two pieces. There's the, the magnetic moment the electron has as a consequence of its spin, plus the magnetic moment that it has as a consequence of its orbital angular momentum. You add those two together, and you dot them into the external magnetic field. So this is another mu dot b thing. But this time, the b isn't internal. It's not built into the hydrogen atom, like the spin orbit coupling but it's actually something in the laboratory. You have a magnet in the laboratory, and you stick the atom in the magnetic field, and you look at what happens to its energy levels. And the answer is the energy levels change. Now, here's the thing. The spin magnetic moment is E over m times the spin of the electron. The orbital angular momentum magnetic moment is half of E over m times the orbital angular momentum. So what that means is when you put in all that stuff and you calculate the perturbation, you get L plus twice S. Now here's the thing. We found out, due to the spin orbit coupling, that L plus S is um, conserved. J is conserved. But this Hamiltonian is not equal to J, or not proportional to J. It's proportional to L plus 2S. But I can rewrite L plus 2s as uh, j plus s. And if I have a weak magnetic field where the perturbation due to the Zeeman effect, or due to the external magnetic field, is much smaller than the fine structure, in other words, much smaller than the spin orbit part, then I can treat the Zeeman effect as kind of a perturbation of the solution we got for the spin orbit situation. So we're going to be talking about very weak fields for the moment. And in that case, j is a good quantum number. j is conserved because j is conserved in the spin orbit coupling. And it's much larger than the energy that we're talking about calculating. And so the idea is you can think of j as being good and s as varying. But uh, the thing is, so parts of s are going to average out to 0, and parts of s are going to be, uh, are going to have a finite average contribution. But uh, we've got to figure out which parts we need to worry about. So the idea is j, the total angular momentum, is conserved. Neither l nor s are conserved. And so you can think of l and s as sort of processing around the vector j. And uh, in the presence of the magnetic field, of course, uh, the vector j is going to process around the magnetic field, but uh, s and l process around j. 
So the precession of SNL around J is due to the spin orbit coupling. The precession of J about the z direction is the Zeeman effect, but it's very slow compared to the precession of S and L around J. And so what we end up with is that the only piece of S that survives is the projection of S in the J direction. How do you calculate the projection of a vector in another? Well, you take the dot product of the vector with the direction you're interested in, and you multiply by the direction you're interested in. And uh, that's, of course, a unit vector in the direction you're interested in. And so if we write that out for S and J, if we want to know what's the projection of S along the J direction, we end up with this expression. And uh, if we put all that in, we get the expectation value of J plus S is the, um, it's J, and then we have to add in just the projection of S along the J direction. We're going to work this out as a board work problem today if we have time. But uh, I can tell you that the answer turns out to be that the Zeeman effect, perturbation energy, is proportional to the magnetic field. It's proportional to the Z component of J and to the, uh, this thing called the Lande factor, which we'll work out on the board today. And uh, it's also, of course, in the book. You can see how that turns out. But uh, that's all for this time. Next time, we're going to go ahead and look at the strong field limit. What happens if the Zeeman field is much greater than the internal field, so that the Zeeman Hamiltonian is uh, much greater than the spin orbit coupling Hamiltonian? And then what about if the two perturbations are roughly the same order of magnitude? How do we handle that? That turns out to be a little bit of a mess, but, uh, but we need to see how it's done. And so we'll do that next time. All right, it's lesson 15. We're going to talk about the Zeeman effect and, uh, in other words, degenerate perturbation theory. And uh, before we get into that, it turns out it gets to be kind of technical and a little bit complicated. And in order to be more clear, I thought it might be useful to, to address a problem, I I'll call it a toy problem, that has... Um, some of the same features, but uh, is a little easier to grasp what's going on. Now, you may remember last semester I had a similar toy problem where we had two different basis sets and we were expanding various kets in terms of one basis or the other basis and looking at operators and how they uh, looked in one basis or a different basis. And that's kind of the game we're playing here. Um, I have two sets of basis vectors, the A basis with A plus and A minus, and the B basis with B plus and B minus. And the notion is that uh, we have two different Hamiltonians. We have the original Hamiltonian, which we solve, and we discover that the eigenvectors and eigenvalues of that Hamiltonian are most simply expressed in the A basis. In fact, A plus and A minus could be eigenvectors of the original Hamiltonian. And then there's a perturbed, there's a perturbation to that Hamiltonian, but the perturbation has a different set of eigenvectors and eigenvalues, and those are most simply expressed in the B basis. So B plus and B minus, for example, could be eigenvectors of this perturbation. And uh, so let's think about that. Let's say we have uh, a, a Hamiltonian A, which has eigenvectors A plus and A minus, and eigenvalues plus big A and minus big A. And at the same time, there's a Hamiltonian HB, which has eigenvectors B plus and B minus, which are distinct from uh, Hamiltonian A. And uh, it has eigenvalues. Those eigenvectors have eigenvalues plus capital B and minus capital B. And the, the idea here is to say, well, what happens if I have a, um, a Hamiltonian, which is the superposition of those two, uh, the A Hamiltonian and the B Hamiltonian? Now, understand, there's no reason why, for example, capital A could be zero. If capital A is zero, that means that the eigenvalue of those two uh, 
basis vectors, a plus and a minus, is degenerate. The a is, if a is 0, then they have the same eigenvalue, 0, in other words. Um, I can always add or subtract a constant to a Hamiltonian so that even if I have uh, two energy states that are degenerate but have uh, non-zero energy, I can always add or subtract whatever that energy is to make them zero eigenvectors. So this is not all that, I mean, it doesn't seem general at first, but it's not that, it's not that ungeneral, it's not that specific. So um, anyway, the total Hamiltonian is going to be the superposition of the A part and the B part, and gamma is going to represent some kind of a variable strength so that I can turn on HB, I can make it as strong as I like by making gamma a big number. If I want to turn off the uh, perturbation, I can make gamma equal to zero. And you can see that the results of our uh, calculations are going to depend on gamma. Gamma is like a knob of a magnetic field generator in the laboratory or electric field generator in the laboratory, something. Okay, so um, the notion is that you can represent the A Hamiltonian as a matrix in the A basis. You can see it's quite simple because uh, the A basis is the Eigen basis, so that means it's diagonal in that basis. Uh, but what about HB? What about HB? So the idea is um, you can, you know that HB acting on A plus, that's the question we need to ask ourselves when we're trying to find the representation of HB in the A basis. I can, I can decipher that by rewriting A plus as a superposition of B vectors of the, in the B basis. So at the very beginning we had the dictionary that told us how to go back and forth between the A basis and the B basis. And, uh, and you can see that if I write out what A plus is, in the B basis, then I can easily determine what happens because we know that B plus is an eigenvector of HB with an eigenvalue plus capital B, and B minus is an eigenvector of HB with an eigenvalue minus B. So immediately we get this result. If I want to recast that in terms of the A basis, I can simply use the same dictionary to express B plus and B minus. Um, in terms of a plus and a minus, it gets a little ugly, but notice you can pull the a plus terms together, you can pull the a minus terms together, and the thing simplifies quite a lot, and you can see that it ends up looking like this. Similarly, you can pull the same trick with a minus, and ultimately it turns out that a hb acting on a minus looks like this, and at this point we can just read off the uh, A plus and A minus components and put them into a matrix which tells us that HB expressed in the A basis ends up looking like this. So you see, for example, the A plus component of HB acting on A plus is one-third and the A minus component is minus two, the square root of two over three. Of course, all multiplied by capital B. But uh, you can see where this matrix comes from looking at those two lines above. So now, let's form the overall Hamiltonian as HA plus gamma times HB. And how does that turn out? HA is the diagonal matrix we just saw. HB is this more complicated looking thing, but if I throw it all together, I get this terrible monstrosity. Okay, that is the total Ham Hamiltonian um, in terms of gamma in matrix form expressed in the A basis. If I want to find the eigenvalues and eigenvectors of this matrix, all I have to do is uh, take the normal strategy of solving the eigenvalue problem. The eigenvalue problem is, of course, H acting on some arbitrary ket is equal to a number times the same ket. That immediately gives us this uh, characteristic equation which says the determinant of this ma this matrix, notice the minus lambda is on the diagonal, has to be zero. You plug that equation into your uh, favorite computer algebra system, at least that's what I did because I'm lazy, and it came out with, uh, with this result. And uh, 
That tells us that there are two eigenvalues, and of course I can plug those eigenvalues back into the original eigenvalue problem and, uh, and compute the eigenvectors. In the end, we get some eigenvectors that depend on gamma. As you can imagine, when gamma is equal to zero, the eigenvectors are just a plus and a minus, but as you dial gamma up, um, the eigenvectors approach b plus and b minus. So um, let's do a little demo now and you can see how that goes. So here we have the eigenvectors. Let's scoot back a little bit. Uh, a plus and b, a, a plus and a minus. And uh, I'm going to turn on gamma and you'll watch gamma go. Gamma is going to be just a proportional to time. And once gamma gets going, you'll notice that the eigenvalues, which are going to graph in this window, um, separate, and that the eigenvectors, which we'll display here, are going to rotate toward b plus and b minus. So let's do that. You can see that effect happening. As time goes on, the eigenvalues now become proportional to time, essentially, um, and the eigenvectors now are re approaching asymptotically the eigenval eigenvectors b plus and b minus and that's the way it works good now let's get back to business we're going to go back to the zeeman effect now we talked about the weak field zeeman effect last time today i want to deal with the weak field and the strong field and everything in between it gets a little complicated First, let's start with the fine structure correction. Remember, the fine structure correction to the hydrogen atom only depends on J. So it makes sense that the fine structure Hamiltonian, that is the Hamiltonian that includes the fine structure corrections and the original Coulomb potential of the hydrogen atom, would be most simply expressed in a basis where J is well-defined. In other words, in the J M sub J basis. And that's right. The Zeeman Hamiltonian, on the other hand, is more complicated. It's proportional to LZ plus 2 times SZ. Now remember the 2 in the SZ comes in from the fact that the spin angular momentum is related to the magnetic moment of the electron in the similar way as the orbital angular momentum is related to the orbital magnetic moment, but there's an extra factor of 2, and that comes from the Dirac equation and relativity and all that stuff. But uh, but it is well known that the electron's magnetic moment is twice what you would expect, assuming that the electron was just a ball of charge spinning with some angular momentum. And uh, that is a purely relativistic effect. But let's, as Griffiths does in the text, let's go ahead and consider the n equal 2 levels of hydrogen. And when n equals 2, we have a couple of different possibilities. We can either have L equals 0, and S is a half, we can have L equals 1, S can be a half, and, uh, and J could be a half. Or you could have L equals 1, S equals a half, and J is 3 halves. So the J is 3 halves case is the so-called extended, and the J is 1 half case is the so-called jackknife configuration. Let's consider these three ways of having the system organized. Of course, if L equals 0, the only contribution to J is the spin. So that's quite easy. Uh, the states of well-defined J also happen to be states of well-defined L and states of well-defined S. So um, it makes it quite simple. In the extended case, there are four possibilities because J is 3 halves. So M sub J could be 3 halves, a half, minus a half, and minus 3 halves. Of course, in the jackknife configuration, j is only a half, so there's only two possibilities. m sub j is plus a half, or m sub j is minus a half. But in order to compute the Zeeman Hamiltonian in uh, the j basis, we need to know what the values of L, uh, m sub l and m sub s are, because those are the things, those are the lz and sz quantum numbers that tell us what the Zeeman effect is going to be. What, what is the energy associated with the Zeeman effect? So let's begin with the S states. Of course, uh, they're the easiest because L is equal to 0, M sub L is equal to 0. The only thing we don't know is what's going on with S. 
of course, if j is j, if m sub j <coughs> is plus a half, then s m sub s has to be plus a half, and if m sub j is minus a half, m sub s has to be minus a half. So it's not very complicated. This is quite easy. Um, where it gets more interesting is when we go into the jack or the extended configuration, where now we have to express uh, three halves, three halves in terms of L and S. Of course, the only way to get an M sub J of three halves is if M sub L and M sub S are both positive. So M sub L has to be plus one. M sub s has to be plus a half, so they can add up to three halves. And there's no other combination of M sub L and M sub s that does that. So that's sometimes referred to as the top of the ladder. Okay, we're all we're all the way at the top. But the question is, how do I form an M sub j is one half out of various L and S states? The answer to that question or in order to answer that question, you really have only two options. You can either go and grab the dreaded Klepsch-Gordon coefficient table, uh, or you can remember last semester we did this once before, and I kind of walked you through it. But basically the idea is you pull out the J minus operator. If you apply the J minus operator to uh, a state, J is 3 halves, M sub J is 3 halves, you're going to get something proportional to j is 3 halves, m sub j is 1 half. In other words, it's going to bump the m sub j down by 1. And there's going to be a factor out in front. You remember that crazy square root thing that's out in front? But the basic idea is that j minus takes m sub j down by 1. But remember that j minus can be expressed as l minus plus s minus because um, j is l plus s. And uh, and that means that I can operate on the state 3 halves, 3 halves with L minus plus S minus to figure out what I get. And the answer is, of course, when L minus acts on that state, you get 1, 0, but it doesn't touch the spin part. And when S minus acts on that state, you get 1 half minus a half, but it doesn't touch the L part. So when you add those two together, you get two pieces. One piece has 1, 0, a half plus a half, the other piece has 1, 1, left the L alone, but 1 half minus a half. So you end up with a superposition of two different states of L and S. That's why the JM states don't always have well-defined contributions. They don't have well-defined values of L, M sub L, and M sub S. If you measured M sub S in this state, you'd have a 67% chance, roughly, a two-thirds chance of getting plus a half and a one-third chance of getting minus a half. And similarly, if you measured M sub L, you'd have a two-thirds chance of getting zero. You'd have a one-third chance of getting one. And the crazy square roots in the front arise from those crazy square roots that show up in the front of the results of the L minus, S minus, and J minus operators that you remember, I'm sure, from chapter four. If you don't, you might go back and remind yourself how that goes. But that's the idea. So we can replace, or we can express, three halves a half as a superposition of states of different M sub L and M sub S. We can play the same game with three halves minus a half and the same game with three halves minus three halves. It should be no shock that the three halves minus three halves is simple again, just like the three halves plus three halves, because there's only one combination of M sub L and M sub S that give rise to that M sub J. Okay, I know this is technical and it's complicated, but what can I do? It's the way nature works. And in the jackknife configuration, it's a similar idea. It's just that now we need a different combination of M sub L and M sub S that adds up to a half, but it has to be orthogonal to the combination where that had J is three halves. And if you think about it for a little bit, you'll see that the only combination that does that has to have different signs on the two terms, and the square root of one-third and the square root of two-thirds have to swap places, so that when you dot those guys into each other, you get zero. And then you can use j minus to get the one-half minus one-half version, the j equals one-half, m sub j is minus a half version of the same ket, and you end up with this. And so let's summarize what we've got here. 
we'll write down every single one of these guys. This is the order that Griffiths puts them in for a reason that we'll get to in a second. Um, basically the first four kets are top of the ladder, bottom of the ladder kets. So they are interesting in that they are simultaneously eigenvectors of J, L, and S. And they have well-defined values of J, M sub J, L, M sub L, and S, M sub S. So these guys are simultaneous eigenvectors of both the fine structure Hamiltonian and the Zeeman Hamiltonian. So there's no ambiguity about these four states. We don't need to do, in fact, we're done. We can basically write down the answer for all four of them. The trouble comes in 5 and 6 and 7 and 8. And the way these are grouped, uh, I want you to look at them for a second and notice that uh, the grouping has to do with the fact that they interact with one another. They have the same values of m sub j. And so um, these guys, through the action of the Zeeman Hamiltonian, they connect to one another. In other words, the Zeeman Hamiltonian uh, has a non-zero inner product between five and, or matrix element between five and six, and a non-zero matrix element between seven and eight. But they're the only ones that connect. In other words, five doesn't connect with seven or eight or one or two or three or four. Six doesn't connect with seven or eight or one or two or three or four, but it does connect to five. So, um, and we'll see why that's important here in a moment. Let's review for a second what's going on. Uh, now, the fine structure Hamiltonian is diagonal in the J basis. We've already figured that out. And uh, we know that uh, the energy that we need to use in our expressions for energy is the two, the two state. We're, we're dealing with the n equal 2 state. And so I, I know that. And let's see what else I know. I can go ahead and compute the uh, the fine structure Hamiltonian by uh, putting in the fact that E2 is E1 over 4, square it. That gives us a 32 downstairs because it's 2 times 16. And, uh, and I know n is equal to 2. So I can replace the n in this generic expression with eight, uh, 2 and get 8 over j plus 1. Now, <clears throat> since it only depends on j, and we only have two values of j, we have j as a half and j as three halves, we can compute these guys directly, um, putting in what uh, the actual energy is. We can see that uh, the fine structure Hamiltonian has basically two values. When j is a half, it works out to be minus 5 times the fine structure constant divided by h squared times 13.6 electron volts. We're going to call that gamma. So I don't have to say that so many times. And when j is 3 halves, it's minus gamma. So j is 1 half is minus 5 gamma. j is 3 halves is minus 1 gamma. So that's the plan. Uh, this is important because we're going to be making this nasty matrix and we want to simplify it as much as we can. So by taking all those constants and just calling them gamma, it'll look a little less uh, formidable. Okay, now let's remind ourselves about the Zeeman Hamiltonian. It's diagonal in the LS basis, and uh, the point is if we apply, for example, the Zeeman Hamiltonian to some particular state, let's say the 0, 0, 1 half, 1 half state, the L comes in with the 0, the S comes in with the half, and so we get um, a half times 2 times the junk on the left, uh, and then there's an h-bar. The h-bar comes from the SZ uh, because SZ is h-bar times uh, m sub s. And so you end up with this junk out in front, but to simplify the thing, we're going to call that junk out in front beta. So beta is going to be h-bar e over 2m times the external magnetic field strength. And so it's proportional to the magnetic field strength, but it uh, and it's got units of energy, essentially. Okay, So since we know that the first four states are eigenstates of both the Zeeman and the fine structure Hamiltonian, we can immediately compute the matrix elements of Hz uh, on those states. They're, they're on the diagonal, and they're all proportional to beta.
Now, what happens when you apply HZ to one of these other superposition states? Well, it gets complicated. Well, if take uh, psi 5, for example. Psi 5, uh, the first component has m sub l of 0 and m sub s of a half. So that gives you uh, m sub l plus 2 m sub s is 1. But the second component has m sub l of 1 and m sub s of minus a half. So that gives you uh, m sub l plus 2 m sub s of 0. So these guys are not, neither of these are, um, let me say it this way, this ket psi 5 is not an eigenvector of the Zeeman Hamiltonian. The first component is an eigenvector, it's got an eigenvalue of 1 uh, times some junk, and the second term has an eigenvalue of 0, but uh, neither of them directly are, uh, or I should say the superposition is definitely not an eigenvalue because the second term gets wiped out, the first term um, survives, and so what you see is that Hz acting on psi 5 only has the first term in the answer. That means that uh, if I take psi 6, remember psi 6 was a superposition of the same two kets with different, uh, no, I'm lying. No, no, I'm not lying. It's a superposition of the same two kets uh, with different coefficients. And um, that means that psi 6 has a matrix element on Hz acting on psi 5. This is what I meant by the fact that psi 5 and psi 6 are connected together by the Zeeman Hamiltonian. They have a non-zero matrix element. And if you calculate the complex conjugate, of course, it's a real matrix element. So the complex conjugate is equal. And so... If you plug all that in, you'll notice that uh, psi 5 and psi 6 have non-off-diagonal matrix elements. Psi 7 and psi 8 have off-diagonal matrix elements. And those arise from the Zeeman Hamiltonian and uh, in more or less the same way. Now, what you, the good news is, because these are just little 2 by 2 off-diagonal elements, you can pull that... Uh, Submatrix out and treat it as a little system, the psi 5, 6. And so what we know are the, so you could think of psi 5 and psi 6 as sort of like a plus and a minus in our toy problem. And you could think of uh, the components of psi 5 and psi 6, the c components that have definite values of m sub l and m sub s, those are a little bit like the b. Uh, eigenvectors in our toy problem. And the beta is a little bit like the gamma <laughs> from the toy problem. I picked unfortunate Greek letters, but the point is beta is just a parameter. It's proportional to the magnetic field strength. It has units of energy, but it basically tells you how strong the magnetic field is. So as you adjust the magnetic field strength, um, the uh, the eigenvectors are going to transform from eigenvectors of HFS to eigenvectors of HZ. That's the idea. If but the the strategy is the same. You basically uh, treat this as a little eigenvalue problem. You put in the lambdas just like we did in our toy problem. You get out energies which are eigen energies of the total Hamiltonian, the original and the new, and. Uh, and then you can go back and compute eigenvectors at the same time by putting these lambdas back into the original eigenvalue equation. Let's take a look at this uh, result and see if we see anything interesting. Um, I'm going to rearrange things just a little bit. And then let's look at the case when beta is much, much less than gamma. If beta is much, much less than gamma, being careful with the square root. If you factor the um, 4 gamma squared out of the square root, you get the 1 plus something small inside the square root. You can uh, treat that as 1 plus something small over 2. Uh, if you use the expansion formula, the, you know, the small parameter expansion formula for square roots, and you get this result that um, the energy of the 5, 6 states, there are two of them. One of them has um, negative 3 gamma plus 2 gamma, Notice that's minus 1 gamma, so that means this must be uh, a j is 3 halves state. And 
what is the beta going to be for that one? I got plus beta over 2, then I get plus beta over 6, so that's going to be 2 thirds of beta. And so uh, this one must be one that goes, depends on beta, like plus 2 thirds. Now if you go back and look at the lesson last time, you'll notice that the low field energy for the Zeeman effect had, it was proportional to m sub j, it had this Lande factor g sub j in it, and it had the uh, magnetic field and the uh, Bohr magneton and all that stuff. But the, the main point is that you ended up with something proportional to beta as the energy. And if you go back and check it, you'll see that in this case, if j is 3 halves uh, and um, l is equal to 1, then the factor in front of the beta turns out to be 2 thirds. So that it's, it's useful to go back and check that this thing actually works out. And, and you should feel confident, or at least you should go check it, and then you'll feel confident that it, it, that it does. And the, uh, what about if beta is very large? <clears throat> Again, being careful with the square roots. Um, you see that in this case, uh, there are two possibilities. The plus sign gives you a plus beta. <coughs> Excuse me. The minus sign gives you zero. So the two states, five and six, one of them uh, goes like plus beta for large b for large beta, and one goes like zero. And I think we already saw that when we were going through the states originally. So you can do a similar thing with uh, seven and eight. You can look at the low field behavior. You can look at the high field behavior. But uh, and again, you can go back and check that they have reasonable, uh, reasonable properties, but, uh, but that's the idea. Just to remind you how it goes, there's the expression from, last, from the last set of slides, and there is the Lande factor. And uh, if you go and put in the L and Js for the different cases that we're studying, we have three Lande factors to worry about. There's the uh, S states, L equals 0, have G sub J equals 2. Then we've got the jackknife configuration has G sub J is 2 thirds, and the extended configuration has G sub J is 4 thirds. If you uh, put all that in, you end up with, um, so for example, states 1 and 2, you end up with uh, minus 5 gamma plus or minus beta. Um, the j equals one half states, remember, have a low field energy of minus five gamma, and uh, putting in the Lande factor, you get plus or minus beta. If you're looking at the extended configuration, in the case where uh, j is three halves and m sub j is three halves, then you get minus gamma. That's the three halves j has a higher low field energy minus gamma. And then the magnetic field part goes like plus or minus twice beta. The more the trickier ones are the five seven and the six eight, and those guys also go um, like two thirds and one third beta, and that comes out of the Lande factor and all that stuff. So this is just to help you if you want to sit down and work it all out. You can check to see that the low field results of the eigenvalue problem produce the same results we got when we treated it as a weak field perturbation of the fine structure. And uh, just to kind of show how that works, I'm going to do a little demo now so you can see it for yourself. Okay, so here I've actually put into Grapher uh, the four energy eigenvalues that we got out of the, the uh, math. And I've uh, in order to make it easier to zoom in and out, I've uh, added basically something like two and a half. Uh, actually, I've what have I added? I've added three, I think. I've added three uh, gamma to the energies so that the high energy state becomes plus two on this scale and the low energy state becomes minus two. Remember, originally they were minus one and minus five, but if I uh, zoom in, the origin is going to be way up there somewhere, and it, it's not as pretty. So, But these are the high energy states. Remember, the high energy states where the J is 3 halves, and uh, the lower energy states where J is a half. And so these are the high energy and the low energy. 
Now there's only one source of j is 3 halves. That was when l is 1, s is 1 in the extended configuration. But there's two ways to make j is, minus a, or j is a half. You can either have l equals 0, or you could have l equals 1 and s equals a half in the jackknife configuration. So both of those are in here. And we just worked through the math to see how that turns out. What I, what I want to show you, it, and this is the magnetic field direction to the right. You increase the magnetic field strength and the energies separate. And notice the energies even cross down here. Um, what happens if I zoom out? So let's zoom out. And you'll notice something interesting. These guys kind of pair up in a way. So now we're starting to look at the high field. Notice uh, the j is 3 halves and j is 1 half states sort of come together. And what we end up with, if you look out here a little ways, is 5 states. I'll zoom out again. It looks like there's only 5 states out here. Now they're actually combinations of states of different j. States of different j are coming together to make states of definite L and S. So this is the high field limit. I can even zoom out some more. This is the high field limit. And uh, in the high field limit, all that matters is M sub S and M sub L. The J doesn't make any difference anymore. Uh, we're looking at a different basis. It's sort of like in the toy problem, now we're in the B basis. The B basis is the LS basis instead of the J basis. And um, in this case, remember the energy went like it was proportional to L sub Z plus twice uh, S sub Z. So, you know, S sub Z is only plus and minus a half H bar. L sub Z is plus or minus, uh, zero, minus one, zero, or plus one. But when you multiply the S sub Z by two, then it contributes either plus one or minus one. And so you end up with five states. You could have uh, L and S both, both positive, in which case you get, uh, essentially two ones. You get a one from the S and a one from the L. You could have uh, L equals zero and S is plus one. Um, you could have L equals plus one, S equals minus one. N not S equals minus one, but S contributes minus one because of the factor of two and so on. So it turns out there's five states and those are the five states in the strong field Zeeman limit. But in the weak field limit, you end up with two groups of four. The S, the J is three halves and the J is one half. And uh, it's a com more or less completely different behavior. But the uh, theory that we just worked through handles both the weak field and the, the high field limit. And that's how it works. Well, welcome back. It's lesson 15. So um, this is going to be a very short set of slides, which I guess is probably good news if you are pressed for time. But I did want to just touch a couple of things. The first is there's a new homework assignment. Um, what I thought I'd have you guys do is to look at the Zeeman effect and notice that Griffith's states 7 and 8, the one he calls psi 7 and psi 8, go from two specific low field states to two different high field states. What I want you to do is to look at the eigenvalues listed on page 283 the, as a function of beta and the information from page 281 that describes what states 7 and 8 actually are and how they're defined in the in the J basis. And uh, I'd like you to uh, identify what are the low field states, what do they correspond to, definite values of what observables, and then in the high field limit, what do these two particular states correspond to in terms of their quantum numbers and their observable, uh, observable values. So that's the idea. Just uh, write out in words, I guess, with any justification you can based on the equations. Then the second part of the homework is to begin our study of the polarizability of the infinite square well. Now this is kind of a toy problem. It's not something anybody probably actually does. Although with nano uh, technology and uh, quantum dots and so on, I guess you, this might be you know not too far off from something you might actually do. But the notion is this. You get an infinite square well. You apply a potential that produces a constant force to the left in the infinite square well. And I'm going to represent that as a potential that's balanced. It has no net potential. The average potential over the entire well is zero. So the effect, the reason for that is simply that it doesn't affect the energy of the states um, to first order. 
and all I, all I care about at this point is the ground state. So I'm just going to have you guys study the ground state perturbations, what happens to the ground state wave function, what happens to the ground state energy under the influence of this perturbation. And the answer is to first order, not much goes on. <coughs> um, so, or I could maybe that, yeah, the, the uh, expectation value of the potential in the ground state is zero. So, uh, but what we can do is look at the second order non-degenerate perturbation theory in energy, and the first order non-degenerate perturbation theory, what is the effect on the wave function, and, uh, and that's what I want you to do this week. So, uh, ultimately, once you get the wave function, you can also estimate the electric dipole moment after the perturbation is applied and see that there's a, an induced dipole moment that isn't there in the ground state before the perturbation is applied, but after the perturbation is applied, then you get a dipole moment. And uh, so that's the idea. All right, so let's talk about the hyperfine structure. The idea of hyperfine structure is that the electron, in addition to seeing the magnetic field uh, due to the fact that the electrostatic field of the proton produces a magnetic field in the electron's frame, the proton also has a magnetic dipole moment. Now it's a very <coughs> <coughs> it's a very tiny dipole moment, but it's there nonetheless. And so um, we can compute it. Uh, I'm not going to go through the details. Griffiths tells you, explains all that, and uh, it's fascinating. But uh, basically, what you wind up with when you're dealing with the ground state of the hydrogen atom, the only thing that really matters is the spin of the electron and the spin of the proton. You get a uh, perturbation that's proportional to uh, the spin of the proton dotted into the spin of the electron. Now the total spin is the sum of those two guys, and it turns out neither the spin of the electron nor the spin of the proton is a good quantum number in the sense that it's conserved in the system. But the total spin is. In other words, the total spin commutes with sp dot se, but neither se nor sp individually commutes with sp dot se. So that's the idea. And using the same tricks we worked out last time, you can show that the there's a relationship between s squared, se squared, sp squared, and uh, and since these guys are all spins, the se squared and the sp squared, they're both spin of a half. Those are just definite numbers. And uh, when you plug everything in, you see that uh, the dot product of se and sp depends only on the total spin quantum number, the magnitude of the total spin quantum number. Of course, what choices do we have for the total spin? Well, there's only two. Either uh, you can have the total spin as zero, that would be the singlet configuration, and if you plug in s equals zero into that expression, you get minus three-fourths h-bar squared uh, for the dot product. Of course, the other option is that it's the s equals one case, the, um, the two spins add to make a total spin of one, and if you plug that into the expression for se dot sp, you get h-bar squared over four. And since the perturbation energy is proportional to se dot sp, that means the triplet and the singlet states, while they're degenerate, if you don't include this interaction, if you do include it, you get, um, you get a difference in energy. And that is the energy associated with the spin, spin. it's called the so-called spin-spin coupling. Uh, you guys have already encountered this energy if you've done any reading about radio astronomy because the famous um, 21 centimeter line of hydrogen is exactly this transition. It's the transition from spins aligned to spins anti-aligned. The an or the, I'm sorry, the aligned spins has a lower energy. The anti-aligned spins has a somewhat higher energy. So uh, there we have it. And then I just want to point out, we haven't really officially started this section yet, but the idea behind this section is so easy that I just wanted to go ahead and say it, kind of get you started on that. Um, it's called the variational principle. And the notion is this, the energy of the ground state of any system is less than or equal to the expectation value of the Hamiltonian uh, for any wave function. You pick any random wave function you like, uh, use that wave function to compute the expectation value of the Hamiltonian, and the number you get is always going to be greater than or equal to the ground state. 
Of course, if you happen to pick the wave function that is exactly equal to the ground state wave function, you'll get the equality. But any other wave function, you're going to get something bigger. So the idea is you can use this to get as close as you like to the exact ground state wave function. You simply randomly pick a wave function. You calculate the energy. Then you make a random change. If the energy goes down, you take it. If it doesn't, you don't take it. Or you use the uh, some kind of a strategy, like, for example, the Metropolis algorithm or something to figure out um, how to make the change, when to accept it, when not to accept it, and so on. And uh, eventually, you will find a, uh, a wave function that is arbitrarily close to the exact ground state wave function. That's the idea. All right, we'll see you guys next time. Okay, guys, it's uh, lesson 16. It's time for some Diffusion Monte Carlo, and we're going to touch again on the variational method. I'll basically just recap what we said last time. It's such a simple idea. It doesn't really require much, but, uh, but I want to just reinforce what we already talked about. Let's go back to this guy. Do you remember this equation? I guess you probably do. It's nothing other than the Schrodinger equation. The, uh, <clears throat> the left-hand term just says the time evolution of the wave function uh, is proportional to the total energy operator, the Hamiltonian operator, acting on the wave function. Now, of course, the Hamiltonian is made up of kinetic energy part and a potential energy part. So nothing new here, but... Uh, Interestingly, if I replace the time variable with a minus i times tau, so we make a variable substitution, essentially, um, and then clear out the i's, divide the i's out, and multiply through by minus 1, we get the following result. Uh, that is, the time derivative of this wave function thing uh, goes like the... Uh, second spatial derivative minus the potential energy function times the wave function again, uh, I want you to notice that that's looking an awful lot like the diffusion equation. If we, uh, if we imagine adding an offset to the energy, call it ER, and a little more about that in a minute, but uh, if we add an offset to the energy, notice that what we have here it's sort of like uh, when you have diffusing, a diffusing gas or a diffusing um, material embedded in some other material, for example. You know that the time rate of change of the concentration of the stuff that you're following um, depends on something like a diffusion constant times the second spatial derivative of the concentration. And then if there is a source of this stuff, it would appear as a source term. And, uh, and this equation, even though it's the Schrodinger equation with the time replaced with a minus i times tau, um, it looks exactly like the diffusion equation. And so the notion is that if you understand the diffusion equation and you understand how to solve it, you can use that understanding to solve the Schrodinger equation. That's the underlying sort of insight to Diffusion Monte Carlo. So I'm going to skip now to look at the Computing Project 4 handout, and I'll just sort of touch on the highlights of that. Of course, you can read it and uh, see how it goes and ask questions if you, if you have trouble. But I thought it would be worthwhile to just sort of go through it bit by bit uh, in the slides so you could see how that goes. OK, so this is Computing Project 4. And uh, it's about Diffusion Monte Carlo. And you'll recognize these equations. These are right out of the slides, the Schrodinger equation, what you get when you replace the time with the complex time, what happens when you clear some signs, and finally, what you end up with. Now, one thing I want to point out is that uh, if you have an eigenstate of the Hamiltonian, of course, you get the eigenvalue that goes with it. If I were to add an offset to the Hamiltonian, just a constant offset, what it would do, you, you, your eigenstates would still be solutions to the original equation, but now the eigenvalues would simply get that offset. So the eigenvalues would change, but the eigenvectors would be the same. That's an important point. Now, the thing is, um, if I... Uh, if I rewrite that a little bit, let's see, and I write an arbitrary ket as a superposition of eigenkets, 
With the original Schrodinger equation, of course, if I, uh, if I add a constant offset to the Hamiltonian, that just adds a constant offset to the omegas. And uh, that doesn't actually have any physical impact because we all know that if you multiply a wave function by a constant phase, even if it's a superposition state with multiple different eigenvalues, that constant phase just hits all the eigenvalues or hits all the components of the wave function. And when you compute anything physical, it doesn't really make any difference. But if we change this from a complex exponential to a real exponential, like this, with the diffusion equation, then notice that adding or subtracting a constant to the Hamiltonian adds or subtracts a constant to all these real exponential terms. Now the thing is, I, wa I want you to focus on the ground state for a second. If we were to add the ground state energy in such a way that the let me say that again. If we were to add an energy to the Hamiltonian such that the ground state energy became zero, then as the time progressed, notice that the factor multiplying the ground state wave function would just be one, e to the minus zero times tau. But all the higher energy states would have a positive constant here because they would all have energies greater than the ground state energy, and so they would naturally decay out in time because the, when you change the time to an imaginary time, then these guys all become, um, all become real exponentials that decay. The only one that wouldn't decay would be the ground state because if you could set the offset energy equal to the ground state energy. So here's the idea. We fiddle with the offset such that the number of walkers, here, so here's the plan. You, you make a bunch of walkers. They're just random uh, representations of positions in the state space of the eigenfunction. They're basically, you think of them as little guys that wander around in quantum state space. And uh, they get born in those regions where the source term is large. Let's go back and look at the diffusion equation again. Where this term is large, you create walkers. Where this term is small, you destroy walkers. And you adjust this energy, E sub r, so that the number of walkers remains relatively constant. When you do that, it turns out the wave function that survives after you run this thing for a long time is the ground state wave function because all the higher order eigenstates decay away as a consequence of that real exponential effect. So we can rescale the equation. We rescale the distance with a length scale, rescale the time with a time scale, rescale the energy with an energy scale, and uh, <coughs> the equation under those circumstances looks like this. And uh, basically we get to choose the length scale and the time scale, for example, and then the energy scale gets dictated, or we could do it the other way around. Um, and we can talk about that, that in class. The, the technical details of scaling the equation uh, are a little bit tricky, but the main idea is we adopt position, time, and energy units to make the equation simple. And, uh, and then we run this algorithm, the Walker algorithm, in time so that it correctly represents a diffusion process. And what we end up with is the diffusion of walkers around in such a way that their average <laughs> position, that their average concentration, is proportional to the ground state wave function. That's the idea. Now there are a couple of Python tricks I want to point out to you guys. Here's the basic code, which of course you can read. I'm not, I'm not going to explain every single line. but the main point is this flat non-zero function is probably the most different, most distinct function to one you've used before. And what it does is it finds, it computes the indices of an array that satisfy a certain condition. So flat non-zero returns a set of indices where this number is greater than zero. Uh, this number is described in the paper that I'll hand out in class today. But basically it it's a measure of whether or not uh, we want to keep the walkers around in a certain location or we want to kill them or we want to create more. So 
If the condition is satisfied, we want to keep these walkers. If, the, if this condition is satisfied, we want to actually make more walkers. And if neither of these conditions is satisfied, then the walkers, we want to let them go. So basically, in regions where the potential is low, we want to make walkers. In regions where the potential is high, we want to destroy walkers. And, uh, and the flat non-zero is an easy way to go find the indices of walkers that satisfy a certain criteria. Take goes and pulls those walkers out. And, uh, and the nice thing about these functions is that we can they're very efficient, and we can use them without having to write a bunch of loops. So we don't have to iterate through all the walkers to discover which one satisfy a condition. We simply call flat non-zero. It very efficiently finds all the indices where this condition is satisfied. Take very efficiently goes and pulls those guys out. And, uh, and that's the way the thing works. And now let's, uh, let's look at a demonstration of that code to see what it actually does. And uh, we'll be right back yet, uh, to get really good results. And, and we're only running 1,000 walkers. So uh, we're going to find out that the, the biggest limitation to this algorithm is time. It takes time for the thing to converge. And that's where the parallel computing comes in. Later in the semester, we'll be invoking multiple computers working in tandem to compute uh, Monte Carlo quantum ground state wave functions. All right, very good. Finally, let's just quickly review the variational principle. The notion of the variational principle is that if you compute the expectation value of the Hamiltonian using any old wave function at all, the number you're going to get is always going to be greater than or equal to the ground state energy. So that suggests uh, an, a way to discover what the ground state wave function is and what the ground state energy is. So you just parameterize a wave function any old way you like, superpositions of Fourier terms or uh, exponentials or Gaussians or whatever, whatever you think is going to give you a good answer. And then you simply adjust the parameters of that wave function to minimize the expectation value of the Hamiltonian. Assuming you know the Hamiltonian, you can always calculate an uh, approximate wave function and compute the expectation value of the Hamiltonian. And by fiddling with the parameters of the wave function, you can make the expectation value as small as you like. So that's basically the idea of the variational principle. We're going to get some experience with that uh, in the next couple lessons to see how that works. but. Uh, but that's the notion, and that's really all there is to it. All right, we'll see you guys next time. Hey guys, welcome back. It's time for lesson 17. We're going to apply the variational method in a couple of contexts, and we're going to talk about some homework problems. Um, this is the last lesson before the next exam, which will be lesson 19. Uh, lesson 18, of course, is just going to be our wrap-up and review, so there's no formal new material that day. It's all about getting you guys ready to... Uh, to take an exam about this stuff. So let's uh, march ahead. I want to mention Computing Project 5, which won't be due till after the exam, is the application of the variational method to some problem of your choice. Now, the, uh, the handout is written up uh, about the helium atom, but uh, in the spirit of broadening the scope of these things and giving you guys more choice about what you do, I was going to suggest that you could also study the hydrogen uh, n the negative hydrogen ion, that's a hydrogen atom, a proton basically, with one extra electron. Uh, there's a homework problem about that. Uh, in fact, there are a couple that relate to that. Then there's the lithium plus ion. Notice that all three of these, the helium atom, the negative hydrogen ion, and the positively charged lithium ion are all systems with a nucleus and two electrons. So they have a lot in common, uh, but they are different systems. And uh, Another one that might be interesting is the hydrogen molecular ion. So that would be two protons, not in the same nucleus, but two separated by some distance, that share only one electron. So we have two protons sharing a single electron. That's another case that we can handle with the variational method. We're going to handle. We're going to look at the neutral hydrogen molecule for project eight. Uh, at least that's my 
proposed uh, context, but uh, we'll get to that later. Anyway, in this time, and, and look, if there's another system that you're interested in that you can attack with the variational method, then uh, go right ahead and do it, and I will accept that as your competing project five. So as long as you're applying the variational method in some way, uh, you're good. Okay, let's talk about a homework problem. This is extending the problem we did for the last homework. Now, for the last homework, what you did was you took the infinite square well, which is our old buddy, and you added a potential, which was uh, anti-symmetric about the midpoint of the infinite square well. And you computed the uh, perturbed wave function and the perturbed energy of that system using non-degenerate perturbation theory. That was the idea. What I want to have you guys do now is to attack the same problem as a variational method problem. So the idea is you think of the wave function as a little bit of the ground state plus, or mostly the ground state, it's almost all the ground state, plus a little tiny bit of the first excited state. And how can you think of that as a variational method? Well, you can think of it as a variational method by imagining ex computing the expectation value of the Hamiltonian, minimizing it with respect to variation in the parameter beta. Now, one thing about the variational method, it's extremely important that you normalize the wave function. When we worked out the wave function for the degenerate perturbation theory, we didn't worry too much about normalizing in the end. We just said it was, it was the ground state plus some dimensionless parameter times the first excited state. Um, it turns out the normalization is uh, one over the square root of one plus beta squared. But uh, we didn't worry about working that out. We could get the energy without worrying about the normalization. We got a correct value for the first order correction to the energy uh, without worrying about the normalization constant. And the reason is that the normalization constant is second order in beta. As you can see, it's got a beta squared in it. But when we're using the variational method, the fact that the parameter shows up in the normal normalization constant turns out to be important. Uh, you need to compute the expectation value of the Hamiltonian to second order in beta so that when you minimize it by taking the derivative, you'll have something uh, useful <laughs> left over. You can't, you can't minimize a linear function of beta. It's got to be at least quadratic in order to get a minimum. So you have to keep beta up to second order and it does make a difference. So um, that's the idea. You keep terms in the expectation value of the Hamiltonian up to second order in beta. If you keep all orders of beta, it, it's kind of a hideous expression and uh, you don't really learn a whole lot. <coughs> Excuse me, you don't learn a whole lot more anyway. Uh, if you, if you wanted to go to higher order in beta, you'd have to include the uh, n equals 3 state and other things that make it more complicated. So I want to keep it simple, but you can't keep it, uh, you can't keep it that simple. You have to go up at least to second order in beta. What I want you to do is to show that beta turns out to be alpha divided by 3 times the energy of the ground state. That's the same result we got with degenerate perturbation theory, so that's comforting. You can also um, show that the energy that you wind up with turns out to be the ground state energy minus alpha squared over three times the ground state energy. In other words, by adding this potential and, uh, and having this perturbation take effect, the energy is actually lowered from the uh, ground state energy. Now, um, I want to think about this a little bit. What is it that's exactly happening? Um, you could think of it as a trade-off of kinetic energy to potential energy. If you turn up beta, what are we actually doing? We're incorporating some of the first excited state. Notice that the first excited state is the sine function that has two antinodes. It's got one on the left of the center and one on the right of the center. And if you turn that up, it's going to shift the probability distribution to the left. By shifting the probability distribution to the left, we go down in potential energy because the potential energy is lower on the left than it is on the right. So by that logic, you'd want beta to be as big as you could get it. The problem is 
that beta is the amplitude of being in the n equals 2 state. And of course, the n equals 2 state has four times the kinetic energy of the n equals 1 state. So by turning beta up, we're going down in potential energy, but we're going up in kinetic energy. And so the minimum total energy happens when beta has just the right value to minimize the Hamiltonian expectation value. And of course, that is when beta is equal to alpha divided by three times the ground state energy, as we showed. Uh, but, it, but we didn't treat it in the perturbation theory. We didn't treat it as a minimization problem. But you can see that uh, using the variational principle, you get the same result. But you can think of it as minimizing the expectation value of the total energy. In other words, we got a new ground state with a lower energy than the original ground state. But that ain't all. Because there's another way we can attack this problem. We can treat it as an eigenvalue problem. So I'd like you to do that as the second part of the homework. I want you to show using the unperturbed states as a basis. In other words, the ground state and the first excited state, n equals 1 and n equals 2, show that you can write the Hamiltonian this way, um, where alpha is the same definition we used before. It's, the, it's minus the a matrix element between n equals 2 and n equals 1 with the perturbation. Uh, and what you have to do is find the eigenvalues and eigenvectors. What you can show is that the eigenvector is uh, the ground state plus beta times the first excited state. And if you want to normalize it, you can, but you don't have to. I mean, the eigenvectors, of course, are uh, eigenvectors regardless of normalization. And what you can show is that the eigenvector has the property that beta is alpha divided by 3e1, again, same result, and that the energy of the low, now when you get eigenvectors, you're going to get two eigenvectors and two eigenvalues. We're really only interested in the ground state, the new ground state, so we want to look at the low energy eigenvector and the low energy eigenvalue. You can also learn by studying this that the first excited state also gets shifted, but it gets shifted up by the perturbation. And uh, that also kind of makes sense if you think about it, but uh, we don't have to think about it right now. Right now, I just want you to focus on what happens to the ground state, what happens to the energy of the ground state, and what happens to the uh, composition of the ground state in terms of the unperturbed states. And so for board work today, we'll get started on these two problems. Hopefully we can make some decent progress and we can also talk about the computing project. We can talk about what's bothering you guys and stuff like that. But that is the job for today. To see you next time. A really quick note before we start the actual lesson, I just wanted to point out a couple of things. Um, it's come to my attention that uh, there is uh, a population in the class that is uh, feeling like we're doing too much theory, and this last couple of chapters has been a lot of theory. I'll acknowledge that. This one next chapter, the WKB approximation, is also fairly theoretical, um, but it's just one lesson. I'm going to just move on, and, uh, and we'll get directly to some applications, including uh, lasers, laser cooling, uh, time-dependent problems, and uh, Hopefully that will be more palatable for those of you who are eager to actually see some real numbers and work with actual applications. I hope that helps, and we'll see you soon. Hey guys, I've got a quick set of sides, slides here for Lesson 20. It's actually uh, <clears throat> not that complicated, so maybe, uh, maybe this will be easy. <laughs> All right, so let's talk about uh, what is the WKB approximation. Um, what are we going to do with it? Basically, there's two primary applications. The um, You can do approximate bound state energies of various systems, and um, you can handle tunneling. So most of the time, you're working in one dimension, although there are ways to make it work in higher dimensions. But uh, let's talk about the basic idea. <clears throat> the notion is, if I've got a potential that's fairly slowly changing, and um, in such a way that the wavelength is short, say, compared to the distance over which the potential changes a lot, then I can approximate a sort of local phase or local f spatial frequency, local wave number k, um, using the uh, kinetic energy plus potential energy is equal to a constant. And that gives me a way to estimate <coughs> what k is, and, uh, and then I can 
integrate k dx in order to get the local phase. So the notion is that the wave function goes something like e to the i integral k of x dx instead of just k times x where k is a constant, k is now a function of x and so to get the phase we need to integrate it. And then there's the notion that it, it goes like 1 over the square root of the wave number and that's a simple consequence of the fact that uh, as remember wave numbers like momentum so uh, as the momentum gets larger the probability of finding the particle at a place with high momentum is less than the probability of finding the particle at a place with low momentum. But this is a very weak dependence because notice that the amplitude goes like 1 over the square root of k, but k goes like the square root of the energy, or the kinetic energy. So if the kinetic energy doubles, the amplitude is only going to change due to this factor out in front by about 20% because it's the square root of 2 and the square root of that so it's uh, it's not a very big effect. In order for the amplitude to change by a factor of 2 um, then the kinetic energy has to change according to that factor out in front, the, the amplitude factor um, by something like a factor of 16. So a lot of times we can just ignore that factor out in front and just worry about the phase. In fact, it's the phase is all you really need to get the bound state energy. The idea is if I've got some kind of a potential, let's say, that varies in sp space and uh, at s any given energy, the notion is that uh, there will be some turning points. And so the idea is that the total phase between the turning points has to be something like an integer number of pi. Uh, if you think about a round trip, um, it tr if it traverses the space between the turning points twice and you want a total phase change of 2 pi, um, then between the turning points you'd want a, a phase change of pi. Now, the nature of the turning points turns out to affect the details of exactly what you get. Um, it turns out that if you have a hard boundary, like an infinite square well boundary, the wave function goes to zero, and the phase starts then at a definite place. But if you've got a soft boundary, like this depicted here, then the wave function doesn't go to zero at the boundary, and there's a little bit of sloppiness in the phase, and that's, uh, we'll, we'll talk about that. Let's, uh, and also, of course, the point is that uh, inside, where the potential is less than the energy, you get a sinusoidal behavior. But uh, if you look at the integral up there, if you go back and look at the definition of k, when v is greater than e, then the k becomes imaginary. And of course, this turns from a complex exponential to a real exponential. And, uh, and we expect to see decaying exponentials outside where the energy is less than the potential. Um, so here's a typical example how it might turn out. Um, notice that there are turning points, and uh, at the turning points, the general behavior of the wave function goes from sinusoidal to exponential. And you also notice that the wave function does go up a little bit as a result of the kinetic energy dropping, um, but not a lot. Now, here's the thing. Uh, you see that the wave function... Uh, spills over the turning the turning point. I, I wish I, I guess I can't exactly point here, but anyway, if you look at the right turning point, the wave function, it behaves as if it, it could continue sinusoidally and go to zero a little bit past the turning point, and the same way on the left. We're going to find out that that represents basically an eighth of a wavelength. In other words, there's an eighth of a wavelength shift when the boundary is soft, as, as is depicted here. But if the boundary is hard, like an infinite square well, or a w point where the wave function goes to zero, then there is no spillover. The wave function goes to zero right at the boundary. And we'll work some examples in class and see how that turns out. The other thing is, uh, if you look in phase space, <coughs> if you look at k as a function of x, um, what you get are these sort of phase space trajectories. You can think of these classically, uh, this could be like a oscillator that's oscillating back and forth. It's got turning points. Each of the lines here represents a line of constant energy. But uh, the bound states occur when the uh, area enclosed by one of these curves 
is 2 pi greater than the area enclosed by the previous curve. In, in other words, if you know one bound state energy and you can draw the curve of constant energy for that bound state, the next bound state happens when you get an additional 2 pi of phase. Um, and so the, <coughs> the area in these uh, ellipsoids, I guess that this is a simple harmonic oscillator potential, but the area between these neighboring bound state energies happens to be 2 pi. The area of the central one depends on the boundary conditions. So um, if the boundary conditions are hard on both sides, the area of the central one is 2 pi. If you got one soft boundary, then you take away um, basically pi over 2. If you have another soft boundary, you take away another pi over 2. And, uh, and that's how you get uh, the energy of the simple harmonic oscillator ends up being n plus a half. That half comes from the area of that of that central guy. And the last application that we're going to deal with is uh, is tunneling. You guys remember tunneling from last semester. It wasn't really in the book, but I talked about it anyway. Uh, what we talked about last semester was actually the WKB approximation. So you take this expression that we uh, cook up by um, assuming that the potential changes slowly compared to the uh, wavelength and and then you see what happens when V is greater than E when that happens the K becomes imaginary so we think of this as a kappa you define kappa to be it's the same definition as K except the V and the E are swapped so now kappa is real and uh, you plug that in to the WKB approximation and you get an expression for the uh, relative amplitude on the right side of the barrier compared to the left side of the barrier. So, And we've done this before, so you guys don't really have anything new to learn here, but I just wanted to point out that, uh, that this is the WKB approximation that allowed us to make this claim, and it, it really isn't, uh, isn't that hard to use. All right. Well, that's enough rambling for today. I think we'll... Uh, We'll see you guys in class. Okay, here we are with lesson 21, and it's the time-dependent perturbation theory. I'm going to focus on an application, since I, I want to try to consider applications uh, more frequently. So I've tailored this whole conversation around the issue of what happens when an electromagnetic wave interacts with an atom. Now, Many of the interesting situations occur when the frequency of the rate of the electromagnetic wave matches an energy difference between two particular states. And in that case, you can pretty much ignore all the other states because their their effect on the situation is negligible. And just focus on the two states that are involved in the interaction with the electromagnetic wave. And I'm only going to consider today a monochromatic or a exact single frequency electromagnetic wave. And uh, next time we'll see what happens if the electromagnetic field has more frequencies in it. But today we'll just focus on a single frequency. So let's get started. The idea is to imagine you have an unperturbed system, an atom just sitting there, and then a time-dependent perturbation comes along and affects it in some way. The notion is that we can describe the atomic quantum state as a superposition of a little bit of state A and a little bit of state B. And we're going to further assume that we start out in state A and we make a transition to state B. Um, now normally if there's no perturbation, the Fourier coefficients, the amplitude to be in state A and the amplitude to be in state B are constant. They don't change in time. But what we're going to do is to incorporate, we're going to solve the Schrodinger equation by permitting a, the CA and CB now to become functions of time that evolve according to the effect of the perturbation. So that's the idea. So here's the Schrodinger equation. We plug in the Schrodinger equation as a little bit of the original unperturbed Hamiltonian plus the perturbation. And when you take out the terms that cancel. Of course, uh, you know that uh, the unperturbed Hamiltonian acting on state A just gives you the energy Ea and so on. And uh, I'm going to define omega A to be 
uh, EA over H bar and omega B to be EB over H bar in the normal way. Anyway, when the smoke clears, you end up with this expression. So notice that there are derivatives of the coefficients in there. They come from the derivative of the wave function, which of course has got products of um, these coefficients and e to the minus i omega t and so on. Um, what I want to do now is to uh, hit with a or b from the left and we get these uh, expressions. I'm using the shorthand h a a h prime a a excuse me is the matrix element between state A and state A of the perturbation and so on. We get these two expressions and they are expressions for the time derivatives of CA and CB in terms of the current values of CA and CB and the matrix elements of the perturbation. So notice if the perturbation is zero, CA dot and CB dot would be zero, which just means they're constant, which would be the case if there's no perturbation. So um, I also want to focus on a case that's uh, generally true, a case that's uh, a situation that's generally true, and that is that the diagonal matrix elements are zero. So let's assume that those guys are zero. There's a nice problem in Griffiths that, uh, that uh, encourages you to investigate what happens if they're not zero, and the answer is not very much interesting happens. You just add or subtract a constant to the... Uh, to the energy, essentially, but it doesn't it doesn't have any real effect on uh, transitions, which is what we're interested in today. So, so let's uh, just focus on the case where their diagonal elements are zero, and that simplifies the equation somewhat because it gets rid of those those uh, C A terms in the C A dot equation and the C B term in the C B dot equation, and uh, and you just get that C A dot is proportional to C B and the matrix element between the AB state in the perturbation and CB dot is proportional to CA and the matrix element between the B and A states uh, of the perturbation. So notice what that says is um, CB dot, the, the perturbation basically connects CB with CA. If CA is not zero, then it gives CB dot a value. And if CB is not zero, it gives CA dot a value. So the amplitude to B in state B is going to change if there's a large amplitude to B in state A and there's a connecting matrix element through the perturbation. So here's the idea. Let's say we start out in state A at t equals zero. How do we express that? Well, you just say CA is equal to one and CB is equal to zero at t equals zero. So that means the system is definitely in state A. And let's further assume that H prime is in some sense weak. So that means that um, the rate of change of B is going to be slow, say, compared to um, omega naught or, or uh, omega B and omega A. Oh, by the way, I snuck in here a definition. I'm defining omega naught to be the difference in frequency between state B and state A. I don't know if you caught that. I should have said something back in those equations, but if you look at the top of the screen, you'll see that uh, I've substituted omega naught for the difference omega B minus omega A. So what I can do then, if, if uh, H prime is weak and CB is zero, then I can forget about CA dot. It's not significant because CB is zero and H prime is weak. But CB dot, because CA is 1, CB dot is not going to be negligible. And so I can simply integrate that equation, substituting for CA. I'll just put in <coughs> 1. It's a constant value. And I get an integral that I can evaluate. And uh, I'm interested, in particular, in electromagnetic oscillation. So let's, or uh, electromagnetic fields. But we're talking about optical fields where the wavelength is many, many times the size of an atom. So I can just assume that I can calculate the uh, matrix element H prime uh, AB and H prime BA. Uh, it's going to turn out, I'll, we'll talk about this a little more next time, but as we've seen before when we talked about the, uh, the effect of a constant field on various things, harmonic oscillators and square wells and so on, um, it's proportional to the matrix element of the position. 
And, uh, and that's simply because the wavelength is so long that the field near the atom is essentially a constant in space, um, but variable in time. So it's, it's just a constant field multiplied by a cosine. That's the idea. And uh, I'll go ahead and put that perturbation in. And you can see that what we get is the integral of a cosine. That's an easy integral to do. We break the cosine into e to the i, uh, e to the plus i omega t and e to the minus i omega t, and we simply crank it out. Now, it's not a very enlightening result, unfortunately. So I'm going to make what people often make in this business. I'm going to say, let's imagine that um, omega is very nearly equal to omega naught. So that means if you look at these two expressions, the omega plus omega naught is going to be much, much, much greater than omega naught minus omega, or omega minus omega naught. And, uh, and for that reason, that first term in this expression is so small, I can basically neglect it compared to the second. That's the idea. Um, this is the so-called rotating wave approximation. And if I make that approximation, this, uh, this expression simplifies. I can kind of factor some things out. Uh, I can convert that numerator into a sine function by factoring out an e to the i omega naught minus omega t over 2. And, uh, and we get the following uh, somewhat simplified result. And I can use that to compute the probability. Now, the first thing you'll notice about the probability is it's not a constant in time. In fact, it oscillates in time. So, and it oscillates with the frequency that uh, goes like the difference between the electromagnetic wave frequency and the difference in frequency between the two states in question. So um, the probability ends up looking something like this. Of course, uh, it has a maximum value that depends on the uh, detuning. Detuning is a measure of how far the electromagnetic wave frequency is from the resonant frequency, omega B minus omega A. Um, and of course, it's proportional to the matrix element of the perturbation, VAB, the amplitude of that matrix element um, between the two states. That's the idea. And also, the period of that oscillation depends on the detuning as well. So if the detuning goes to zero, the period becomes very large. So you can think of it, it's almost like beats. There's almost a beat between the, uh, the electromagnetic field frequency and the resonant frequency. Um, also notice that the probability blows up, the maximum probability blows up if the, uh, if the detuning goes to zero. And this is a consequence of the fact that we only did the one term in the perturbation series. This is the first non-zero term in the perturbation series, which you generally you'd have to do an infinite number of them to get the exact answer. So our result is only valid as long as the probability remains small. So that means we either have to look at very short times <coughs> if the uh, if omega naught is very close to omega, or we have to um, look at very large detunings, stuff like that. Um, in a little bit we'll do the exact analysis and we'll see that uh, it comes out sort of similar. But, uh, but it has no such restriction. So we'll see exactly what happens even if the detuning goes to zero. Let's look at the probability as a function of frequency at a given time. So at a given time, if you, uh, if you look at the probability as a function of omega, you'll notice it looks something like this. It looks like a sinc function, sinc squared, actually. It's sine x over x, or sine, o sine uh, <coughs> something times omega divided by omega squared, and uh, it has a definite peak. That peak occurs at um, zero detuning, and the width of the peak is quite interesting. Um, it depends on time. So the longer you run the field, the narrower this peak becomes. Now this goes back to the time-energy uncertainty relationship. Remember that the longer you run uh, the, the longer an experiment takes, the more precise the energy has to be. This is basically what this is saying. If you, if you, run, the, uh, if you run the field for many, many cycles, 
then in order to get any appreciable probability of being in the um, excited state, then uh, the detuning has to be very small. If the detuning is very large, you end up outside of this range, omega naught plus or minus 2 pi over t, and you don't get any appreciable probability. So um, that's a fascinating result, and we'll, we'll probably talk about that more when we talk about what happens when you in introduce collisions <coughs> and what happens when you, uh, when you have more states that the thing can go to, for example, in an ionization or something like that. But let's, uh, let's go back and uh, start over again. You know, I made that rotating wave approximation where we said omega naught plus omega is much, much greater than omega naught minus omega. I made it after we had already done the first term in the perturbation series, and I had done the integral solution for CB dot, or for CB. Um, let's see what happens if we put it in at the beginning. In other words, we make the rotating wave approximation now, before we do any integrals or anything, we say that, well, let's let H A B prime. Um, essentially, what I'm going to do is to take out the, instead of putting in cosine, which is e to the i omega t plus e to the minus i omega t, I'll get rid of the minus i omega part and only leave in the plus i omega part. This has the same effect as that rotating wave approximation. And, um, but it turns out, if you do it at the beginning, you can actually solve this thing exactly. So let's do it. We'll uh, make that substitution, put in the perturbation, and, uh, and I'll actually combine that in the exponential as a single exponential. What we're going to do is to differentiate the right-hand equation and substitute that into the left-hand equation, essentially. Let's go ahead and do it. If we take, uh, we're gonna, I'm going to define delta to be the difference between the resonant frequency, which remember is the difference between the B and the A frequency for the system, and the electromagnetic field frequency. So we're going to call that delta. And I'm going to put delta in parentheses a lot of times so we don't think it's an operator that takes the difference between two values of a variable, but it's actually a value. So I'll uh, take the derivative of the uh, the right hand expression CB I'll get CB double dot and uh, let's see what I'm gonna get I'm gonna get a CA dot and I'm gonna get a CA with a delta coming downstairs and I'll so I'll solve the right equation for CA and plug back in to get something in terms of CB dot I'll solve the left equation for CA dot it's already solved for CA dot I'll plug that in and after a lot of algebra, which I'm not going to reproduce, you end up with this expression, which is a simple second-order differential equation for CB. Notice it's, uh, you got a CB double dot, a CB dot, and a CB. This is screaming for a characteristic equation. If I assume CB has the form e to the lambda t, CB double dot, I get a lambda squared. CB dot, I get a lambda. And CB, I get nothing. I just get a 1. And I can produce a characteristic equation that looks something like this. It's just a quadratic that I can solve for lambda. And I get um, two roots for lambda. So we get these two roots. And the idea is to sort of factor things out. Notice that everything in the radical is negative. So that means it's going to be imaginary. We can factor that i out. I want to make a substitution. I want to define omega r, the raw b frequency, uh, to be what I get in the radical when I move the 2, uh, the, the 1 half in. In fact, multiply that through. And uh, notice that it's, uh, it's the square root of the sum of the squares of the detuning, half of the detuning squared, plus half of VAB over h bar squared. Um, and so the detuning and the size of the matrix element uh, together determine the Rabi frequency. In the case when the detuning is zero, of course, you're just going to get the matrix element. But if I put all that in, I get a nice simple expression for lambda with the two different roots. I can put that back into my expression for CB, 
And notice that uh, because there are two different roots, that means the general solution is going to be a superposition of e to the plus i omega rt and e to the minus i omega rt. But we also have to remember that the initial condition was that CB was zero, which means that A and B can't just be anything, but in fact B has to be negative A, because uh, when you plug in T equals zero, the whole thing has to add up to nothing. And the only way you can do that is if B is equal to negative A. So I can rewrite the uh, e to the plus i omega rt minus e to the minus i omega rt as a sine function and uh, get rid of the B since it's only minus A. And, uh, and I get a simple expression, which I can plug back in and uh, figure out what CB dot is. Remember that uh, CB dot was also related to CA, so I can use this to find CA. If I solve for CA, I get this hideous looking expression. But, uh, but remember that at t equals 0, CA was supposed to be 1. So I can demand that when I put t equals 0 in here, CA is 1. And that tells me that uh, all that junk has to be 1, which gives me an expression for A. So so now I've got the boundary condition satisfied, or the initial condition satisfied, excuse me, that uh, CA is 1, CB is 0, and that, that demands that A have a particular value. I can put that back in and finally have an expression for CA that's completely in terms of uh, known things. And then that also determines CB, because once I have A, I can plug that back into the expression for CB, and I get general expressions for CA and CB as a function of time in terms of the detuning and uh, the Rabi frequency. Now there's a special case I want to talk about, and that's when the detuning is equal to zero. If the detuning is equal to zero, then capital delta is zero, and the Rabi frequency reduces to VAB over 2H bar. If I plug that back in, um, I get a very simple result. Um, I get that the A coefficient just looks like cosine, the B coefficient just looks like minus I times sine, and that means that the uh, probability of being in the A state and the probability of being in the B state simply oscillate between 0 and 1 uh, with a frequency equal to the Rabi frequency. Now I want to point out a couple of things. Both of these results, the first order perturbation theory result and the uh, Rabi result, this so-called uh, rotating wave approximation, um, are only valid if there are no other influences. So that means that, um, for example, no collisions, no other stuff going on. And in addition to that, they're only valid for a single well-defined frequency. And uh, next time we'll generalize that a little bit. I'll even get into the field theory and how you can use field theory to uh, to treat the electromagnetic field not as a external classical electric field, but as an actual quantum mechanical beast in and in of itself. All right, we'll see you guys next time. Okay, welcome to lesson 22. We're going to talk about quantized electric and magnetic fields today and spontaneous transitions. So let's start by discussing what happens if I have a box with only one mode of radiation. And let's, uh, let's just remind ourselves about uh, Maxwell's equations that relate to the electric and magnetic fields. There are basically two of them we're going to be dealing with today. Um, and we're going to be talking about regions where there is very little charge. So we're going to uh, ignore... So we're, we're going to talk about the effects of putting charges in here as a perturbation. So we're going to quantize the fields assuming that there are no other charges so that means the in the curl of B Maxwell equation there is a term that has to do with the current but uh, there's not going to be any free charge and also the divergence of E and the divergence of B we're going to assume are both zero since there's no free charges anywhere um, under those circumstances if you solve if you wrap these guys around each other, uh, you'll find that you get a wave equation, and the wave equation has solutions which, in the spatial part at least, go like the sine and the cosine of kz, where k is a number that 
is set up to satisfy the boundary conditions, and in this case the boundary conditions are going to be that the electric field goes to zero at the ends of the, of the cavity. So we can assume the cavity has uh, conducting walls or something. And uh, let's remind ourselves how the curl works. Curl is a vector operator that acts on a vector field. And in this case, if you apply it to a field that only has an x component, and it only depends on z, so the only thing that's going to matter is the ddz part of ex. And if you work that out, <coughs> it turns out to be um, dex dz j hat. So um, that's the part that matters. Um, re remember that the uh, the middle column, and you do a determinant, the middle column gets a minus sign, but then the uh, ddz ex also gets a minus sign, and those two minus signs cancel out, and you end up with positive dex dz. <coughs> and the thing points in the j hat direction. But uh, of course, uh, if you evaluate that, you notice that you go from sine to cosine. So at least the spatial part of B, because the curl of E has to equal the minus the rate of change of B, the spatial part of B has to go like cosine. So that's something worth remembering. And then let's also go ahead and evaluate dE dt. I'm going to assume that the time dependence of the field is uh, proportional to this thing I'm going to call Q. Q is just some function of time, classically. Well, I don't know what it is yet. I'm going to work it out. Um, and But I want it to have units of length. So what I've done is to divide Q sub n, which would be the nth mode, that n is the nth mode. So uh, Q sub n uh, is going to be divided by some length parameter. Now, it's not necessarily the length of the cavity. It's just something that has dimensions of, unit of length. Um, that makes the dimensions of this thing work out. E0 is some base electric field amplitude. Q is some, uh, like a Fourier coefficient, but it's, uh, it depends on time, and uh, it has units of length. And then the L is just some parameter that has units of length, which we'll work out later. Okay? It, actually, it's going to end up going away, but uh, we'll see how that happens. So let's go ahead and look at the second of Maxwell's equations. The curl of B uh, is related to the time rate of change of E. Now you, we know that uh, the spatial dependence of B has to go like cosine so that the curl of E equation works out to be minus dB dt. But uh, I've come up with a new time dependent function for B which I'm going to call P. The reason I'm calling them Q and P will become clear momentarily. But P is going to have units of momentum. So to make it have units of momentum, I, in order for the units of this whole expression to work out, I need to divide by something with units of momentum. And so I'm going to divide by a mass times a frequency times the same length parameter that I had in the other equation. And, uh, and at this moment, I'm not going to explore what those actually mean, but they're just letters, basically, that scale the magnetic field. Again, the curl of B is uh, expressed in this way, and it works out to be minus dBdz times i hat. Of course, dBdz is um, related to the cosine. If I take the derivative of cosine, I get minus sine, and the minus dBdz and the minus sine cancel, and I end up with a plus sine function. And I get out, of course, a factor of k sub n because I've taken the derivative with respect to z. Also, taking the time derivative of b, um, you notice I get a p dot. That's basically it. And uh, now let's rewrite those two Maxwell's equations in terms of the results we just cooked up. And I get these monstrosities. But you'll notice a bunch of stuff is going to cancel out. So, for example, you notice that uh, the L's go away, and the cosines and the sines go away. And what I'm left with is um, a couple of equations that relate the Q's and the P's. Now, we know from studying electricity and magnetism that if I've got an electromagnetic wave in a cavity, that the electric and magnetic fields are connected to one another, and they're proportional to one another in a sense. And so I'm going to put in that proportionality. I'm going to put in that B naught is equal to E naught divided by C. And uh, 
I'm going to put in that C is omega divided by K. These are just the definitions of uh, C and K and omega. And if I do that, an interesting thing happens. These two equations, which look so hideous, the e naughts <coughs> end up canceling because of this substitution. And some of the other things go away. And I get two equations. I get that P is mq dot. And p dot is minus m omega squared q. Well, the first equation is just the definition of momentum, mass times the rate of change of position. If I think of q as kind of like a position thing, and p is like a momentum thing, then p equals mq dot is just the relationship between the derivative of position and the momentum. And the next equation is basically Newton's second law for a simple harmonic oscillator. P dot is minus KQ. K is M omega squared. So, and don't confuse the spring constant K with the wave number K sub N. I, those are not the same thing. Um, M omega squared is the same as like a spring constant. It's a restoring force. So what we find is that the equations of Maxwell, which are electromagnetic field equations, can be mapped onto the simple harmonic oscillator through this sort of bizarre parameterization. But that's useful. So SHO, simple harmonic oscillator, that's useful because we know how to quantize the simple harmonic oscillator and the procedure is exactly the same. We know that Q and P are non-compatible observables that have a non-zero commutator. We know that the Hamiltonian can be expressed um, in terms of the fields. Let's, let's go ahead and do that. Let's plug in our definitions of the fields. We stick those guys in there. We make our substitutions. <clears throat> we integrate over the size of the cavity. We get the, uh, the volume of the cavity now appears here. And uh, if I make the substitution that E, I, E naught, looks like this. In other words, I've just defined E naught to be this. Again, I want you to suspend your disbelief for a moment to see where this is going. But if I define E naught to just be a magnitude of electric field that's expressed in this way, then this equation for the Hamiltonian reduces to this. But that's just the Hamiltonian for the simple harmonic oscillator. And uh, we know the simple harmonic oscillator already has a length parameter. It's the oscillator length. And we can express Q and P operators for the simple harmonic oscillator in terms of raising and lowering operators. A plus and A minus is what Griffiths uses. The rest of the world uses A and A dagger. So I'm going to switch to the notation of the rest of the world since most of this, none of this material is basically in Griffiths. Um, so a dagger is the same thing as a plus, and a, without any notation, is the same thing as Griffith's a minus. If I plug those two definitions for q and p into the Hamiltonian, um, I get the following result, which is that the Hamiltonian is h bar omega times a dagger times a plus a half. And you know a dagger times a is nothing other than the number operator. It measures the number of a pure quantum state and an eigenstate of the Hamiltonian. And so this just says that uh, h bar omega times the quantity n plus a half. Um, okay, now let's take that. In order to make this all work out, I had to assume e naught was equal to this bizarre expression. Let's plug that back in. <clears throat> plug that back into our field. And then uh, put all this stuff together. We'll put in the operator for q. We'll put in this square root goober thing for E naught, and we'll go ahead and plug that into the formula for the field. And uh, let's see what all comes out. Notice some stuff cancels. The L squared in the numerator of the E naught expression and the L in the denominator of the electric field expression cancel. So this length parameter that I introduced just to keep the unit straight ends up canceling in the end. Um, and when the smoke clears, what I get is an expression for the electric field <coughs> that depends on the raising and lowering operators. The electric, the quantum mechanical version of the electric field, um, once I've quantized the simple harmonic oscillator version 
of Maxwell's equations, uh, turns out to look like a displacement. It looks a lot like the displacement operator for uh, the one-dimensional simple harmonic oscillator, except that it's got this square root of h bar omega over epsilon zero v. Notice that when you square the real electric field, the classical electric field, you get an energy density if you multiply by e naught. And notice if you square this and multiply by e naught, you get h bar omega, which is an energy, divided by volume, so you get an energy density. And it, it's the right thing to put in front if you want to think of uh, one photon being confined, one photon of energy h bar omega being confined to the volume v. So it's a it's kind of a rough concept, but, uh, but at least it gives you some intuition as to why that factor needs to be what it is. And uh, let's, uh, let's talk about the consequences of this. Of course, you could also make up a similar expression for the magnetic field, but because the transitions we're interested in are primarily related to the electric field, the dipole transitions, um, I'm not going to worry about that. You could, of course, do it. Just do exactly the same thing I did with the electric field, but for the magnetic field using the P operator. So let's talk about stimulated transitions. If I have an initial state where an atom is in an excited state, E, and the uh, let's again we're talking about a single mode um, that it's in a cavity with a single mode that has n photons in it that'll be n so the, this expression the first thing is the atoms quantum state and the second thing is the electromagnetic fields quantum state and the final state is going to be the atoms in the ground state and the electromagnetic field now has n plus one photons in it um, can I use perturbation theory to to look at this, and the answer is, yeah, I can. Um, let's imagine the interaction is the same interaction we've talked about in the past, where the electric field gets dotted into the dipole moment. Um, the energy is really minus the electric field dotted into the dipole moment, but remember the charge on the electron is negative, and so uh, it works out to be equal to um, the magnitude of the charge on the electron times the X. Now remember, our electric field only has an X component, so when we take the vector electric field and dot it into the position vector, we just get the X component of the field, which is just E, and the X component of R, which is just X. So that's why we have a scalar here of uh, the interaction energy. And I want to write, just like we did last time, I want to write the quantum state as a superposition of the initial state and the final state with a time-dependent coefficient out in front and then if and now basically the math is identical to what we did last time we can write out the time derivative of the ground state amplitude uh, it's proportional to the amplitude of the excited state and then it's the matrix element between the initial and the final state and then it's this time exponential uh, with the difference in frequency between the initial and final situation. Notice there's no classical field here. The only field is the quantized field of the cavity um, with n photons in it. And the, uh, the perturbation is actually a constant perturbation. So kind of interesting. If we, uh, if we use the same trick we used last time, uh, we can put in what the interaction Hamiltonian is. We get one term that looks like um, GXE, that's the dipole moment evaluated between the two states, the ground state and the excited state. And we get the electric field operator acting on the n photon state and taking the n plus one photon state uh, inner product with that. And notice that uh, A is not going to contribute, but A dagger does, because A dagger takes n photons, bumps it up to n plus one photons and gives us a square root of n plus 1. The other thing is I'm assuming the atom is in the center uh, where the sine of knx is 1 or it's a, a sine of knz is 1. I'm putting the atom at a maximum uh, location of the electric field. If you move the atom around depending on where it is you might not be in a, such a place. Um, in a very large cavity with uh, walls that are very far away, many, many wavelengths away. Um, 
this isn't going to be a big factor. What you can do then is, instead of dealing with standing waves, you can switch to traveling waves representation. Um, but it doesn't make any difference in the end. So we'll just assume the atom is at the center. Um, let's go ahead and uh, evaluate those matrix elements. The GXE, I'm going to call that DEG. That's the dipole moment taken between the states E and G, or the expectation value of position taken between the states E and G. And then, of course, the electric field matrix element turned out to be the square root of n plus 1, just like it is for the simple harmonic oscillator. Now we can integrate that, assuming that the excited state n amplitude at t equals 0 is 1, just like we did before. And um, we go ahead and perform the integral. And what we get is that uh, we have a sine delta t over 2 divided by delta. Notice that there's a square root of n plus 1 there. What if the field contains 0 photons initially? Well, classically, there, nothing would happen because there's no field there. But because that's a square root of n plus 1, you'd still get something. And that square root of n plus 1 is the reason why uh, spontaneous transitions occur. Because the field has some non-zero um, n equals 0 value, or n equals 0 fluctuation, and that causes stimulated emission with no photons. So that's what we wind up with. We can replace the square root of n plus 1 with 1, if n equals 0, and we still get something. Let's go ahead and uh, talk about what happens if I have more modes. This All this has been done assuming a single mode, but of course in a real big box there's going to be many, many modes, and um, this is one of the reasons why the exact location of the atom doesn't really matter very much. <clears throat> because when you add up all those different modes, you're going to get some. And uh, so let's go ahead and talk about it. Now we have a wave function which is no longer just um, two components, but now it's got many, many components. It's got, for every mode in the box, there will be a number of photons in mode 1, a number of photons in mode 2, a number of photons in mode 3. And the atom can be in different states, call those states J. So we'll need a coefficient that depends on time for every possible state that's interesting of the atom, plus every possible number of photons that could exist in each of the very, very many different modes. So n1 could be 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, n2 could be 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, and so on. Um, so this is a very large space of states. And uh, the question is, what happens when we repeat the same procedure? Um, we can basically go through the same process, but what we need to do is to calculate the probability of each of these different modes uh, for, for being uh, populated. And that's going to depend on the number of photons in the modes to begin with, and the number of photons we're interested in being in the modes at the end. And it's a, it's a generally fairly challenging problem. But uh, if we assume that the system starts out with the atom in the excited state, and no photons in any of the modes, then the final state is going to be the atom in the ground state and one photon in one of the modes. And then another state will be a different a photon in another mode and a photon in another mode. So what we end up having to do is to calculate the probability of a photon being in any one of those modes, but we have to add the probabilities up for all the different modes. Um, so basically, we take the expression at the top of the screen and add it up, uh, square it first to calculate a probability, and then add it up for all the different modes. Um, that's not that bad. One of the things we have to do is to go back into the mode counting business, which is exactly the same as it was when we dealt with uh, electrons, fermions, and solids. Or uh, if you've ever talked about black body radiation, it's the same business. <coughs> um, we can switch from k space to omega space. There's not that big a difference between the two. For every k, there's an omega. And uh, omega is just about the energy, and k is just about the momentum, but they're still